Kicking off the list at number 10, medicine shows. Nowadays, medical shows are fascinating. Dr. Pimple Popper, I can weirdly watch that all day. There's something about animal rescues, home renovations, or chiropractic adjustments, you know, I can never be bored. So back in the wild, wild west, the 1860s to the 1890s, they had medicinal showmen. Yeah, these guys would go town to town, of course, selling elixirs and tonics, but they would really nail this pitch. They would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience for these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient and then boom, just like that, they would be cured. One of the most successful of these elixirs was an elixir made by Kickapoo Indian Medicines from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any illness, but really it was more of just a laxative, so you were just in the bush and hoping it got better. Number nine, hop on my camel, partner. When you think of the Old West, you think long open ranges, spurs on boots, and cowboys riding camels? That's right, in 1855, the United States Army decided to import 75 camels to Texas. After all, the terrain in the Old West was fairly similar to the Middle East. The camels made supply runs between Camp Verde and San Antonio, but trouble began when the American Civil War broke out. Eventually, the camels were sold off or simply let go into the wild where they multiplied and began to cause havoc. So much so that folks began to spin urban legends, such as the Red Ghost, a 30 foot tall creature that made people quiver in their britches. When in reality, most people had never seen a camel before, and it was just a feral camel wandering the desert. But I mean, who knows? If Star Wars had a 30 foot camel in the snow, what's to say there isn't one running around in the American desert? Number eight, missing mines. There's billions of dollars worth of gold lost at the bottom of the sea. It's there right now, waiting for you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. But if you don't have goggles, maybe swimming just isn't your thing. No sweat, try the West. Yeah, there's dozens of lost treasure troves hidden in mines still to this day, like the San Saba gold mine or the wheelbarrow mine. There's a few we have heard from in literature from old maps, but none compared to the lost Dutchman mine. The legend has it that a man named Jacob Waltz, a German prospector, found the richest gold mine in the world. That's what he told his friends, and would we ever lie to our friends about gold and the location for it? No, absolutely not. The first gold rush was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock, had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father used it as a doorstopper. Yeah, they used a 17 pound gold nugget as a doorstopper, nice. Back then, this information was game changing once they realized that it was, you know, gold. So Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right afterwards. I just wouldn't have told anybody. I'd be like, is this an affinity stone? I'm just gonna pocket this and then head out east. Head out east. Number seven, Sideshow Crook. Elmer McCurdy was no different in life than any other bandit at the time. What makes McCurdy so unique is in his afterlife. McCurdy met his end on October 7th, 1911, after local sheriffs tracked him down from a botched robbery. McCurdy was taken to an undertaker and prepared for burial. Unfortunately, no one came to claim the lonesome bandit. Not getting paid for his services, the undertaker began to display McCurdy as a sideshow attraction, charging patrons a nickel to view the bandit. The attraction became popular enough to draw the attention of carnival promoters, who offered multiple times a purchased the mummified crook, but were all denied. As the years went on, McCurdy changed hands from multiple sideshow attractions and museums. One day in 1976, a film crew was setting up props for a filming. When someone began to move what they thought was a wax mannequin, it actually turned out to be poor old Elmer McCurdy himself. Eventually, McCurdy was laid to rest in a grave, where two feet of concrete were poured over his casket to make sure no one would come to steal the sideshow crook. Stay in the hole, partner. Number six, cowboys and aliens. Long before the Roswell incident in New Mexico, back in 1947, aliens might have actually visited us. Yeah, the report comes from 1896 from two men in California. They reported that three alien beings were trying to abduct them. Were these just cowboy pranksters? Maybe they had a few shots of whiskey from the saloon? No, one of them was a colonel. Colonel H.G. Shaw and Camille Spooner were going from the town of Lodi to the Fresno Citrus Fair, which honestly sounds like a wonderful time, just saying that. But on route, they were greeted by seven foot tall, slender, aliens. Yeah, the aliens didn't end up taking the two men because they were too heavy. These aliens were too thin and weak. Legit, that was the reason. They just couldn't grab them and take off. So they got back into their spaceship and they took off. How embarrassing is that? Hit the gym, E.T. On to number five, it's for some pretty close cousins. Cue the nervous laughter because suffice to say it, Clara Dietrich and Ora Chatfield were more than close. It's something we know thanks to an article that circled Colorado newspapers on September 17th of 1889, which goes a little 
little like this. An extraordinary elopement. Elopements of persons of opposite sexes are common enough all over the world. Just a brief pause to remind you guys that in the Wild West it was super cool to just be gay and get married. Cowboys even married each other. But did you, asks the New York correspondent of Melbourne Age, hear of two of a kind that fell in love and ran away? Such a thing has actually happened in Colorado where two girls have fallen madly in love with each other in consequence of parental opposition to their living together and have taken themselves to parts unknown. They are Miss Aura Chatfield and Miss Clara Dietrich, the latter the older of the two. Love letters of the most gushing character have been passed between the two and a few days ago when the two were ruthlessly separated, the latter had a severe attack of nervous prostration and neither would be comforted. What makes the case more interesting is that both are women of intelligence and not at all given the novel reading or romantic ideas in general. The younger woman's father has been the cruel parent who endeavored to separate the lovers. He has caused warrants to be issued for the arrest of both with a view of investigating their sanity, but up to date has been unable to find them. It's often enough the case that girls have sentimental attachment for each other, but it does not take the shape of this present case, which seems to be out of ordinary run. The girls who were nieces of an esteemed Leadville City Councilman and Colorado State Assembly member who ends up actually being successful in his mission. When the girls are found, warrants are served and they are separated. There's no happy ending to the story as Clara tearfully promised to let go of her young cousin wife. The <laughs> women remained separated and each respectively married men. Number four is the TTC, aka Train Tip Crash. So in the 1890s, having woken up one lovely morning with the right douse of the sillies, railroad titan William Crush decided that for pure entertainment value, he is going to crash the tip of two trains together to just see what happens. This plan becomes a reality in the pop-up town of Crush, Texas on September 15th of 1896. This dude rounds up 40,000 equally bored and ornery people and temporarily makes the state's second biggest city. The Galveston Daily News reported it was everyone from artisans to clerks to doctors representing all classes, ages, and genders of society. So at 5 p.m. the little foot foot happens and the trains start. The conductors leave the bricks on the gas pedals and throw themselves out of the windows, the first indication that this is already a terrible plan. The trains slam into each other at 50 miles per hour with the massive crowd only about a dozen feet away, who all let describe the chaos that occurred. A sound of timbers and rent and torn and then came a shower of splinters, reported one witness. There was just a swift instance of silence and then as if controlled by a single impulse, both broilers exploded simultaneously and the air was filled with flying missiles of iron and steel varying in size from a postage stamp to a half a driving wheel, falling indiscriminately on just and unjust, the rich, the poor, the great and the small, states another. Two people died, folks lost limbs and chunks of skin, and thousands were hit with flying detritus. A photographer who snapped pictures of the event lost an eye. As for the event's organizer, the railroad company fired him, but the publicity poured in from the event, which made headlines around the world, so the company rehired him and the lesson never got learned. Need a refreshing pick-me-up? Well, number three is tarantula juice, which in the Wild West, it's fair to assume meant like actual tarantula juice. Rest assured, however, they aren't ringing out giant spiders like rags over a sieve. The reality is somehow actually worse though. Cowboys, prospectors, and miners, they weren't too picky about their beverages. The baseline is, is that I needed to get them as drunk as they could possibly be as fast as it could happen. At one saloon in Sierra Nevada, a clever bartender was short on materials for his demanding crowd, so he did the mom Wednesday dinner special of opening the pantry and just combining everything he found inside. Pouring some up, the cowboys and miners and slingers alike, they all love the stuff, even despite some creepy crawly side effects. This is the start of saloon selling tarantula juice, which contains strict and a wood grain alcohol which was distilled from turf. So what's tarantula juice's side effects? Well, the strick gave them a burst of energy, but I mean, as the body processed this mod podge of liquor and substances, their skin would begin to crawl as though tarantulas were running up and down their body. Sometimes if you drank enough, your skin would be visibly twitching. That sensation was often followed by muscle spasms and then lockjaw because that's what you want when you need to yak up spider juice. Number two requires you RSVP to what must have been the world's most tasteless invite. In 1899, a disgruntled Arizona Railroad employee, George Smiley, was tired of all the back pay. When his foreman wouldn't pay any up the cash, Smiley just blew the dude away. Seems to be the common problem solving consensus of the time. Unfortunately for him, he chose the wrong time. A new sheriff, Frank Watron, had been appointed and was eager as hell to make himself into a hard
not meant to be effed with. So when the verdict came out that Smiley was to be put to death, Frank pulls out the cardstock and the Crayolas and makes 50 super fancy invitations reading the following. You are hereby cordially invited to attend the death of one George Smiley. His soul be swung into eternity on December 8th of 1899 at 2 o'clock p.m. sharp. Latest improved methods of scientific strangulation will be employed and everything possible will be done to make the proceedings cheerful and death a success. Yep, pretty tasteless. Bet Smiley turned into frowny at that one. This invite was so rough that it finds its way to the White House, where the President William McKinney demanded it be changed. A second, rather sarcastic, invitation was issued by Watron, wherein the message was changed to, with feelings of profound sorrow and regret, I hereby invite you to attend and witness the private, decent, and humane death of a human being. Named George Smiley, the said George Smiley will be sentenced on January 8th, 1900. You're expected to deport yourself in a respectful manner, and any flippant or unseemly language or conduct on your part will not be allowed. Conduct on anyone's part bordering on ribaldry and tending to mar the solemnity of the occasion will not be tolerated. Number one, under the floorboards. This story begins in 1870 when a prospector was making his way through the lonely mountains of New Mexico and came across a stout wooden cabin at the foot of Palo Flechado Pass. Needing some rest, he approaches and meets the owner of the cabin, Charles Kennedy. As Kennedy's wife, an Ute woman, served dinner, the traveler, making conversation, asked the couple's son if there was any other indigenous people nearby. The boy looked back at him for a moment and then answered, can't you smell the one Papa put under the floor? The unfortunate traveler had stumbled into the lair of one of the West's most notorious who ended the lives of 14 people at his isolated homestead. After adding the traveler to that list, Kennedy also son for the slip up. Kennedy's wife considers that the end of the line, leaves the home and walks all the way to Elizabethtown where she makes a full confession. After unearthing the grisly evidence, the townsfolk drag Kennedy behind a horse until he died and then staked his head outside the local inn. Meanwhile, the leader of the mob that butchered Charles Kennedy was Clay Allison, a violent local vigilante who definitely racked up a higher body count than the serial slayer he beheaded. On one occasion, he tried to settle a petty dispute with a neighbor by digging a grave and proposing they had a knife fight inside of it, thus saving the effort of moving the loser's body. Allison gained notoriety as one of the deadliest participants in the Colfax Country War, a massive land dispute that caused 200 deaths. A war that was started because Allison constable, and when the constable's uncle came a knocking for revenge, Allison got the drop on him and popped him in the local saloon. After that, in a shot of tarantula juice, Allison reportedly stripped naked, tied a red ribbon around his bits, and did a war dance around the crime scene and the still twitching corpse. Kicking off the list at number 10, Going the Distance. First things first, how much was an IPA back in the 1800s? That's why we clicked this video, right? That's all we wanna know. Some beers today cost like $13 at the bar. What's going on? Nowadays we have happy hour, drink specials, wine pairing suggestions that go along with your meal. We have affordable alternatives today at the bar. Back in the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel to get there. Isn't that wild? In the Yukon, their shots of whiskey were like 50 cents a pop. That was, that was a lot of money back in the day. If you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in Colorado, you could get numerous beverages for the same price. And as you would expect, the fancier the establishment, the more you'll spend. But either way, it's not gonna be comfortable. Number nine, manure everywhere. The 1800s were changing times, especially on the Western frontier. Cities were being built, America was under reconstruction, and if you've seen my video on the 1800s technology, then you know how things were about to get a little wild. Except something I wanna talk about today is, well, it's gonna drive moms and wives nuts across the country. How many times have you told your husband or the kids to wipe off their feet before coming into the house? Or stop wearing their shoes in the house? Right? It's the worst! I'm sorry, Mom. Okay, but imagine that, except everyone is bringing in their muddy, bloody, and manure-covered boots into the house. Horses and livestock were just a part of everyday life. That means droppings, or road apples, as they're so commonly called. The smell alone on a hot summer day could make any cowboy turn green. I think I'm going to pew, Dad! <laughs> Number eight, no stools. Okay, this one's for all the bartenders out there. I see you. I respect you. Bar seating is vital. You get your regulars coming in. Joan with the limp, she's so nice. She's always so nice every day. Always gets a grilled cheese. She's the best, always a smile on her face. Individuals who wanna grab a bite and read the paper, obviously they don't need to take up an entire table for eight, so you have spots at the bar. It's ideal, we're used to this. But back in the Western days, bar stools, 
just weren't a thing. Bar spots weren't, it, was, it didn't exist. You couldn't sit and vent to your local barkeep about why your ex hasn't texted you back. They didn't have stools at the bar, they just had the rail at the bottom for your foot. Just that little bar rail there for the little lean right there. A nice cowboy lean. Yeah, I'll just eat fish and chips standing up leaning. Awesome. Just the thing you want after walking in the sun all day long. A foot rail. Number seven, duels at high noon. Let me paint a picture for you, partner. It's a warm summer night, and you find yourself sitting at a card table in a saloon that's named after a barnyard animal. The piano is blasting a ragtime tune as waiters bustle about, serving drinks to unruly cowboys that fill the establishment. In front of you are three unsavory characters, each more than the next. As the night goes on, so do the poker chips. And when one gentleman ain't taken kindly to his losses, some insults about each other's mothers are exchanged. A powerful slap reaches the man across the poker table, matching the energy of Will Smith on an Oscar night. <laughs> Too soon? I don't know. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> That's when it's settled. Tomorrow at high noon, they're gonna settle this like gentlemen. A duel at noon with, with guns. That's, that's how they did it. Does it get any more classic than that? I don't think so, folks. The clock strikes noon, and only one outlaw remains. And he's married to Jada Smith. Number six, only talking. Ugh, here we go. You ever go to a bar, you're having a nice time, you and your pals order some Caesar salads for the table, the night is now well on its way. We're feeling good. Then 10 o'clock hits and you see a band start to set up. Okay, game time decision. Do we settle up and leave before they start? Or do we give them a chance, end up feeling bad, and feel obligated to stay until the very end at 3 a.m.? It's tough. Usually the latter ends up happening. Back in the 1800s, we didn't have to worry about such an issue. Most of the time, these saloons were just for business. The odd time you would have poker, dice, a piano, perhaps, would be in the room with some jazzy fingers making an appearance. But when saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time it was for lawmen, miners, gamblers, just, just pure business. Not many blind dates happening in booths 16. You know what I mean? Number five, Mary Catherine Horony, also known as Big Nose Kate, was a historical figure associated with the American Old West as she was a Hungarian born adult worker and companion to the legendary lawman and gambler Doc Holliday. Kate eventually moved to West and found herself in a rough and often lawless mining towns of the Old West as she worked as the Lady of the Night, gained notoriety for her feisty and independence personality. Kate then became romantically involved with John Henry Doc Holliday, a dentist turned gambler and gunfighter. What a career change. They met in in Fort Griffin, Texas in 1870s following Doc Holliday's death in 1887. Kate Haruni then lived in various places including Arizona and Colorado. She then worked as a nurse and a hotel owner in the early 1900s and Kate moved to Arizona and lived in poverty. She worked in various jobs including serving as a cook and then in 1930s she applied and for received a pension for being a widow of a veteran American Indian war. Doc Holliday had happened to serve as a scout. Big Nose Kate then passed away on November 2nd, 1940 in Arizona at the age of 90 and she outlived many of the famous figures of the Old West. Number four, Bell Bellstar Born Myra Maybell Shirley, Bell Star was a notorious figure associated with the American Wild West during the 19th century. She became known as the Bandit Queen and gained notoriety for her associations with various outlaws and her involvement in criminal activities. Bell married several times with her famous marriage being the outlaw Cole Younger, a former member of the James Younger Gang. After Younger, she then married Sam Starr, a Cherokee outlaw, which contributed to her connection with the Indian Territory present day Oklahoma. Bell Star was also known to associate with herself with various outlaws, including Jesse James, the Younger brothers and the infamous Dalton gang. Her connections to these outlaws and her involvements in horse theft and other legal activities contributed to her reputation. Bell Star and her husband Sam Star lived in the Indian Territory where they ran a horse ranch and their ranch became a haven for outlaws seeking refuge from the law. Bell Star was arrested several times for various offenses including horse theft. However, she often managed to avoid lengthy imprisonments and her criminal activities continued. Bell Star's life came to a violent end when she was shot and killed on February 3rd in 1889 while riding home from a neighbor's house. The circumstances of her death remains unsolved somewhat of a mystery and the identity of the killer was never actually established. Bell Star's life exploits became part of the Wild West folklore and over the years she had been portrayed in many books, films, and television shows contributing to her enduring legend. Number 3, Etta Place. Etta Place is one of the mysteries of the American Wild West as her true identity and details of her life pretty much remains uncertain. She was associated with the famous outlaws Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid as we also know them and is often considered to have been romantically involved with the Sundance Kid. Despite her connections to these historical figures, she is very little known about Etta 
as Edda's place, true identity, and background are unclear. Her real name and place of birth and details about her early life are not actually known at all. And some historical sources suggest that she may have been born in the United States, while others propose that she could have just been European or South American origin. Edda Place is also best known for her association with Butch Cassidy, aka Robert Leroy Parker, and the Sundance Kid, whose actual name is Harry Alonzo Longabo. And she traveled with them during their exploits in South America, where they sought refuge to escape law enforcement in the United States. In the early 20th century, Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kids, and Edda traveled to the South America, where they continued to life of crime, and they are believed to have engaged in bank and train robberies in countries like Argentina and Bolivia. The fate of Edda Place is uncertain, as some theories suggest that she may have perished alongside Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in a shootout with the Bolivian authorities. However, there is actually no conclusive evidence to support this theory, as there may be other theories that Edda Place's true identity, with some speculating that she may have had used multiple names during her lifetime. However, concrete evidence to confirm her background or provide clarity on her true identity is still undiscovered. Number two, born in France around 1829, Eleanor Dumont moved from the United States and became involved with the gambling industry known as the Gold Rush. She arrived in California during the Gold Rush of 1850, seeking opportunities in the Burgian mining towns in 1854. Eleanor ended up opening a gambling establishment in Nevada City, California, where she ran gambling tables and her reputation for her skills as a car dealer. She then became known as Madame Moustache due to the fact that she had distinctive facial hair and refused to remove it despite societal expectations. And over the years, Madame Moustache opened and managed several gambling establishments in various mining towns, including Virginia City and Bodie. Despite her success in the gambling business, Eleanor faced financial challenges and struggled to maintain her enterprises. She suffered major losses and debts that ended up leading to her to a decline in her fortunes. And then Eleanor Dumont's life took a tragic turn, and as in 1879, facing financial difficulties and heartbreak, she took her own life by ingesting an overdose of really intense drugs in Bodie, California. Eleanor Dumont's story proves that a glimpse into the complexities of life during the gold rush and the challenges faced by women trying to make a living in a male-dominated society. Her role as a successful gambler and car dealer, as well as her refusal to conform to traditional gender norms, contribute to her place in the history of the American West. The nickname Madame Moustache and her distinctive facial features further add the colorful and unconventional aspects of her life. And finally, number one, Bonnie Parker was one half of the notorious criminal duo known as Bonnie and Clyde. Alongside Clyde Barrow, Bonnie Parker gained notoriety during the Great Depression for a series of bank robberies and criminal activities in the early 1930s. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born on October 1st, 1910 in Rowena, Texas, and she grew up in a working class family and despite her small stature, developed a love for poetry and drama. Mm, I wonder if that's what caused her to join Clyde. Because she joined Clyde Barrow in January 1930. Clyde was already a seasoned criminal. A little bit of spice, a little paprika, was serving time in East End Prison Farm in Texas. A mutual acquaintance smuggled a weapon to Clyde and he used it to escape. Bonnie and Clyde embarked on a crime spree that included bank robberies, burglaries, and car thefts. They were involved in several pew pew outs with law enforcement and their criminal exploits attracted significant media attention. Bonnie and Clyde were often a part of criminal gang that included their other associates such as the Clyde brothers, Buck Barrow and his wife, Blanche Barrow. The gang engaged in violent confrontations with law enforcement, resulting in injuries and fatalities on both sides. Bonnie and Clyde gained additional notoriety due to photographs found by police at one of their hideouts, and the images depicted the couple posing with weapons, contributing to their image of glamorous and dangerous criminals. Bonnie and Clyde's crime spree came to a violent end on May 23, 1934, when the law enforcement officers ambushed their car near Benville Parish, Louisiana. The officers fired a barrage of bullets, killing both Bonnie and Clyde instantly, and the story of Bonnie and Clyde has become a part of American folklore. Their criminal exploits and romanticized in the media have been a subject of numerous books, films, and songs, and the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde starring Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway further cemented their status as infamous figures. Starting our list off at number 10, a banker. Today, online banking is easy, right? It's a little bit too invasive at times. I don't know. I get an email from my bank. It's like, Mr. McWaters, do you want to provide for your family? I'm like, Chill, relax. Back in the old west, you didn't get a courtesy check-in email. You didn't have overdraft. In fact, the United States national banking system, well, it didn't even exist until 1863. Before then, you'd have what were called wildcat banks. And well, these were pretty fun. Here we go. What they would do is wildcat banks, they would take deposits for a short amount of time, collect your life savings, and then unannounced randomly, they would disappear overnight. Just take all your money and then run for the woods. How horrible is that? Imagine going to the bank the next day and it's gone. The bank's just not there. You're standing there with a card. Like, um, hello? Where did I put this in? You're telling me they pretended to be bankers for months at a time? Fake mustache? Oh, hello, sir. Good morning. Stamping things that aren't even real. They did all of that, and then they just ran away with all of your money. That's wild. I get it now. I get it. The Wild West. After 1863, a noble profession was to work at a bank, you know, and not screw people over for thousands of dollars. The Hudson Bay Company, Wells Fargo, these are all names that began because of these fake Looney Tune wildcat banks. So next time you see your bank call, be thankful. Don't be stressed. Be thankful. 
They've got your back. They're not gonna run away overnight. Number nine, ranch work. Alrighty, I can't do yard work. I don't know if you can tell by my physical being, but I can't lift a brick. My back doesn't allow me to reach the floor. A weird curve in the back, I don't know. Pulling weeds physically hurts my soul. Or maybe I'm just lazy. One of the two, I don't know. Either way, the Old West would have been the end of Taylor McWaters. To be a cowboy, it meant lots and lots of ranch work. It wasn't all yees and haws and kicking around. A lot of the time, you were protecting your cattle. That's stressful, right? All that meat just sitting there in the 1800s, good luck. Cowboys earn between 25 to $40 a month. Yeah, which sounds laughable now, but today that would be around $1,500 a month, which is fine. I mean, for a cowboy, I don't know, it's a bit less than. Do cowboys get sick days? Probably not. They probably just get sick. Number eight, railroad work. This is one of the few jobs from the old west that I actively see every single day coming to work. Living downtown, they're always adding trains and bridges and not finishing any of them. And ideally, you don't want any toxic substance traveling down those lines, right? Fingers crossed. Well, back in the Old West, railroads were meant to assist the booming mining and ranching industries. Thing is, there weren't enough hands. There was not enough to keep up with the rate that they needed to. Like, who's gonna build a railroad? You know, who was the first person? Railroad workers, monthly, you'd make around $1,000, and this brought a wave of immigrants to the West. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads, they all lay over 1,700 miles. Now, making this actual railroad, it destroyed the bodies of these workers, but without it, American history would not be the same. Couldn't imagine making a railroad. That is exhausting. Number seven, blacksmith. All right, close your eyes and imagine a blacksmith. Just any blacksmith from any time. Is he bald? Does he have a massive beard? Is he incredibly strong and wildly intimidating? Yeah, that checks out. That's what a lot of them look like. Missing teeth, banging something pretty loud. That's a blacksmith. Frontier times were almost a golden time for blacksmiths, believe it or not. Hammers, horseshoes, new railroads. It checks out. No, they didn't need any chain mail, but a saddle wouldn't hurt, that's for sure. We could use a saddle. They would earn up to $200 a day. Blacksmiths were always busy in the Old West. They doubled as auto repair services really at the same time. I mean, I don't know. A guy comes in with a busted up carriage. Well, now you're a mechanic. Yeah, go fix this wooden car. Good luck, you have one day. Here's 10 bucks. Number six, journalism. Believe it or not, the newspaper business cleaned up shop back in the frontier. Everyone wanted to know what the tea was. Tuscan, Arizona, for example, back in the day, back in 1831, that one town had five different newspapers. Yeah. Even though there are only 465 residents, there are five different papers. That's stressful. How do you keep up with that much news? I mean, to be fair, before radio and television, yeah, there's probably lots to talk about all day long. That's pretty much all you can do, just talk all day long. So I get it. The industry provided jobs as well. It's very much like YouTube. Here, there's writers, there's hosts, the design and print staff, we have editors. It was a little easier than laying down a railroad, that's for sure. So when it came to jobs, yeah, journalism wasn't that bad. Definitely better than doing anything that has to do with this motion, that's for sure. Next, Mary Ellen Pleasant, the most powerful black woman in the Golden Rush era. Historians indicate that Pleasant was most likely born a slave, but got her freedom at an early age. She worked on the Underground Railroad as a young adult, ushering enslaved people out of the South and into the Northern states. Like many others seeking their fortunes during the Gold Rush, Pleasant and her husband moved to San Francisco. Here, she works as a cook and waitress and a professional eavesdropper. I know we're all taught not to be nosy, but Mary Ellen learned from the conversations of well wealthy patrons, intentionally listening in for valuable information. She took what she learned and began applying it as banking and monetary skills that launched her immediately upwards. She took what she learned to help build a substantial fortune and eventually became one of the richest women in the city. Pleasant was an astute investor whose portfolio included real estate, railroads, restaurants, boarding houses. Pleasant's wealth, however, could not shield her from racism. In 1866, a streetcar conductor in San Francisco refused to let her board because she was black. Outraged. Mary Ellen sued, and the case went all the way to the California Supreme Court. In a historic decision, the courts ruled that segregation on streetcars was illegal in California. However, in return, the Supreme Court reversed the damages Pleasant had been awarded in a lower court ruling. You win some, you lose some, and sometimes you get both. And now it's Donna Barcello. Described as the Supreme Queen of refinement and fashion, Donna Barcello was a prominent saloon owner and a professional gambler in Santa Fe in the 1830s and 1840s. Barcello was recognized for her charm and sharp business skills, which helped her establish as an influential member of high society during the heyday of the Santa Fe Trail. In 1835, Barcello opened a hotel and casino in the city center of Santa Fe. The establishment encompassed an entire city block and featured lavish decorations including chandeliers, drapes, mirrors, and imported furnishings. The casino became a destination for local socialites and trail travelers for its opulence. Barcello oversaw the casino's operations and regaled patrons as one of the 
card dealers, widely known as the best dealer of the card game Monty across the entire southwest. Seeking trade deals and investments that increased her wealth and social status, exercised economic and political sway, she made her fortune from real estate and gold ventures in addition to her casino. And when the American civilian government established itself in Santa Fe during the Mexican American War in 1846, Barcella allied herself with Americans and assisted them by providing information and at times money. Accounts and representation of Barcella were often embellished by those who had labeled her the Queen of Sin. Barcella continued to operate her casino through the 1840s and died in January of 1852. Upon her death, she left several residences, properties, and fortune to her family, including two adopted daughters, in addition to substantial contributions to the Catholic Church and the city of Santa Fe to be used for charitable endeavors. Next up is Sing Choi. She's also known by the name China Mary and was an unofficial leader of Tombstone's Chinese community in the 1880s who supplied labor and opened laundries, restaurants, gambling halls, dens, and a general store. The Old West will always be remembered as an era of cowboy, but during its peak years, Tombstone was actually controlled by a female immigrant. She arrived in Tombstone sometime around 1879, and at that time, the Chinese population was 11 people, and she recognized the unprecedented profits waiting in the western boom towns. Mary's general store was in the center of Hoptown, a Chinese district of Tombstone. Mary's store dealt in both American and Chinese merchandise, and she gained a reputation as a universal accommodator. Everyone knew that nothing in Hoptown was done without China Mary's go ahead, and so she was held in the highest of esteem throughout Tombstone society. She was an organized and shrewd business operator who had an attitude that discourse was bad for business. Her private police force handled any problem that arose within her community. Mary enjoyed the highest of respect. As a result, she could act as a sort of intermediary between her community and other ethnic groups. She was the conduit that made cooperation possible. She was not only a cunning businesswoman, but a sympathetic humanitarian and calculating capitalist. Mary was a genuine immigrant success story. Even, even as a woman in the Old West, she wielded real power. She died in December of 1906 from heart failure when she was 67. Flesh is in the name and it's her game, Susan La Flesh. This is the story of the first Native American to earn a medical degree. Born on an Omaha res in Nebraska, as a young girl, she watched a sick indigenous woman wait all night for a white doctor who, after being called several times, just never came. The woman died the next day, and as Susan later wrote, she saw the need of my people for a good physician. Susan's father taught her her own culture and traditions and then sent her to the reservation's Presbyterian school where she learned English and then high school for further education to survive colonial society. She applies to the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. It's a bold move on her part because even during this time, the most privileged of white women of America faced enormous backlash when attempting a medical degree, let alone a poor native girl. Despite this, she graduated a year early and first in her class. Rejecting a potentially comfortable life on the East Coast, she returns to the Omaha reservation and became the sole doctor for more than 1,200 people across 400 plus miles, and she was only 24 years old. She marries, she has two kids, and she never stops. In fact, she keeps going till she has enough donations and supplies to open the first hospital on a reservation that was not funded by the government. Unlike the absent doctor that she remembered from her childhood, Susan helped anyone who needed it, regardless of race or ethnicity. On September 18th of 1915, Susan passes away. She worked hard to build a bridge between two worlds as her father advised, and it was evident at her funeral. Three priests eulogized her, but it was a member of the Omaha tribe who delivered the final words in the Omaha language. And now for the last lady on the list, Kathy Williams, who also went in reverse as Williams Cafe from 1866 to 1868 with the famed Buffalo Soldiers who patrolled the 900 mile Santa Fe Trail. She was the first African American female soldier to enlist in the army. She's the only documented black woman to serve in the army in the 19th century, and she's the only known black female soldier to be a part of the Buffalo Soldiers. Post war job opportunities for newly freed slaves and for African Americans in general were non existent, so many had no choice but to turn to the military service for employment stability, but also newfound access to health care, education, post war benefits by way of pension. Her enlistment starts in November of 1866 in St. Louis, Missouri. A cursory examination by an army surgeon should have outed Williams as a woman, but since the army didn't require full medical exams at the time, she was minty. Eventually, her third round with smallpox has a surgeon discover her secret in 1868. The post surgeon found out I was a woman and I got my discharge. The men all wanted to get rid of me after they found out I was a woman. Some of them acted real bad to me, Williams said. Once again, dressed as a man, Williams signed up to an emerging all black regime, the 38th US Infantry, which would eventually become part of the legendary Buffalo Soldiers. These units doted out the landscape of the American West and showed tremendous skill and valor in a range 
range of duties. They fought in skirmishes with indigenous people, escorted vulnerable wagon trains, built forts, mapped the territory, protected white settlers, all with subpar equipment and a lot of racism towards them. In trying to make a life for herself, Williams could not have known her story had traveled. It landed with a St. Louis reporter and in January 2nd of 1876, edition of the St. Louis Times Daily, Williams officially became a headline when her story was published. Accounts say she died in 1893, shortly after being denied disability compensation required for her illness. Not for being undeserving of it, but simply because they couldn't grant it to her due to the fact she lied about being a man. Number 10. Dead Bodies for Entertainment Now life sure wasn't easy on the frontier. If the dysentery didn't get you, there was always the chance you'd end up staring down the wrong barrel and find yourself in a hastily dug grave. Or if you were real unlucky, your dead body got stuffed and carried around the country as a sideshow attraction to get folk to spend a nickel to gawk at you. Wasn't too uncommon for sheriffs to pose dead bodies of outlaws like fishing trophies for photos. Imagine that on Wild West Tinder. Elmer McCurdy was one of the last famed outlaws who after a failed train heist found himself buying the farm at the hands of lawmen after a $46 take. McCurdy's body was taken from coroners by someone who claimed to be a friend, but really all they did was sell him across the country to circuses, carnivals as the body of an outlaw that you could come pay a nickel to see. Eventually, McCurdy would end up in a Long Beach, California, where a TV show being filmed was using an amusement park as a backdrop. Set designers were moving a prop mummy in the haunted house only to discover that the prop wasn't too much of a prop at all, but was the stinking corpse of the no good varmint Elmer McCurdy. He would end up getting himself a proper burial after 66 years. Hey, you think your job's hard? Feller was working 66 years after dying. It's a living or a dying. Number nine, cowboy shows. Is there anything more iconic than the cowboy? The symbol of American freedom, manliness, and all things that made the West. Rough, rugged men with thick calluses from hard days work in the field, not sitting around playing pretend, except when cowboys would play pretend on stage for sold out audiences. Now there weren't too much to do out in the old west. TikTok was just what you heard if you listened to a clock. So one way folks on the frontier really enjoyed passing the time was watching a cowboy show, where the slingers of western legend like Buffalo Bill would perform all their best tricks and recreate stagecoach robberies or buffalo hunts for thrilled audiences. Now these weren't particularly uh, uh, well written shows or well acted shows, these fellas weren't thespians now, they were men of the road. But imagine this sort of thing now. Imagine going to a show to watch a marine fire off a bunch of rounds and pretend to rob a truck. Be kind of weird, I guess. But that's what you do when no one's invented the internet. You get up to some pretty weird stuff. Number 8. Eating garbage. If you imagine the frontier, what kind of food comes to mind? Maybe a hearty bowl of chili? A nice stew cooked rabbit over a fire? Oh, you wish. Frontier folk had to eat whatever they could come by in a fork. As such, some Wild West tastes might not sit right on a modern palate. One Virginian cookbook from 1878 lists a way to prepare squirrel stew. And I ain't even gonna bother including the directions in case you wanted to make that at home, cause just the idea of munching a squirrel makes me wanna hurl. I suppose when you really come down to it, squirrel ain't that much weirder than a rabbit, but I wouldn't order it off the menu. Now if squirrel stew ain't your cup of tea, maybe cooked calf brain might do it for you. Boiled brains of calves were commonly served alongside bacon and eggs as a breakfast staple. Other frontier favorites included son of a gun stew, which was a hodgepodge mix of all the garbage you wouldn't normally eat. Calf hearts, liver, intestines, tongue in a pot with onion, salt, and pepper. Mmm, my stomach's ringing, that's just like mom used to make. What's that? That smell. Let's continue on that last point about cooking cause I got a humdinger of a fact that'll make that last one seem downright appetizing. If brains and guts didn't turn you off cowboy cooking, let me tell you this. The Great Plains and the Frontier weren't exactly known for being particularly arborous. That's a five dollar word that means there weren't a whole heck of a lot of lumber to make into firework. Not too many trees round in the desert. So if folks wanted to get a proper bonfire going, you'd have to get creative and use alternative kindling. Namely, uh, feces. Lots and lots of buffalo crap. Now if you're still watching this video and you ain't clicked out, let me keep explaining. It sounds horrifically disgusting, and I certainly would not recommend you use feces should firewood be available, but by all accounting, prairie chips, as they called them, were plentiful, easy to find, and worked real well as kindling. They were quick and hot, and allegedly 
didn't smell half as bad as you think. But I'll take their words for it. I would not be surprised none at all if life on the frontier didn't burn their sense of smell. Living in a mining town was expensive. Now this might surprise you, but working in a mine in a mining town wasn't particularly a good time. It wasn't just awful and hazardous to your health, making your lungs black as midnight on a moonless sky, but it was also affecting your wallet. In fact, living in a mining town was more expensive than it was to live in modern day Silicon Valley. And cowboys don't even have the luxury of Uber Eats. You had to wrestle up all that food yourself. You think inflation's affecting your grocery bill now? During the gold rush, real shucksters would price gouge on everything. If your town was getting hit by that gold rush and prospectors were swarming on in, general stores would raise the price on everything to crazy degrees. For example, a carton of eggs from a flourishing store in California would run you $3 in 1951. Now that don't sound too bad, but adjust that for today's inflation and that carton of eggs comes out to $105 dollars for eggs. That better be the best omelet I ever had. If you knew you had loads of miners in town, you could sell shovels and pickaxes for basically whatever you wanted. You controlled the market. Some stores would sell shovels for $36, which would translate out to about $1,200 dollars in today's dollars. No wonder everyone was robbing each other on the side of the street. The stores were robbing you blind. I'm doing the voice of the whole video, editor. I hope you know. <laughs> Being a miner in the Wild West wasn't as easy as crafting a diamond pickaxe and watching out for creepers. It was a whole lot scarier, and it led to a lot more loss of life, yet even scarier than Minecraft. For many people in the Wild West, the prospect of mining brought with it a lot of positives, and the negatives were often ignored. Negatives such as, uh, I don't know, losing your life? But think about it, you can make significant money if you found some gold. That's a tough choice if you're strapped for cash. While there's very limited resources on just how many miners perished in the 1800s, most of what we do know in terms of loss of life came from newspaper headlines such as Cheyenne Weekly Leader reporting that 38 miners had lost their life in a Wyoming cave explosion in March of 1881. Sadly, headlines like these continue today, but if you think about about the advancements that have been made technologically in the past 150 years, I think it's safe to say that it's a little bit safer now. Now that's not to say it isn't dangerous, because unlike Derek Zoolander's father, I am far too afraid to ever step foot in a mine, unless it's on a computer. Have you heard of the Great Emu War? It took place in the 1930s in Australia and pitted man versus bird, and bird won. Well, it wasn't the only man against animal battle as the United States Army set their sights on their animal target, buffaloes. In fact, the army paid people to head west and slaughter as many as they could, and paid settlers to do the same. So what gives? Why would you want to eliminate a huge creature that will leave you alone if you do the reasonable thing and let it live its life? Well, buffalo played an important part in Native Americans lives at that point, being a major source of food for them, and when the Native Americans wouldn't let the US come and take their land for themselves, they decided to do the incredibly reasonable thing and completely deplete one of their major food resources. And so thanks to the US government, the buffalo population went from around 30 million in the early 1800s to 256 in 1889. No, not 256,000. 256 and they were all in captivity. Yeah, good job USA. Sticking with Buffalo, they served an entirely different purpose. I mean, it was kind of them in a way. Take a look at this photo of the Great Plains. Do you see a tree? No, you don't. But as I just mentioned, you know what they had a lot of before wiping them all out? Buffaloes. And do you know what buffaloes leave behind? Dung. And so what else can you add to use as fuel for your fire? I mean, there's no wood anywhere. So yeah, now you've gathered around the poop fire, singing merry songs, and having a hoot and a half. And as gross as it was, and I guess still does continue to be, it gets the job done. Known as either prairie chips or meadow pies, which for the record sound way too much like a delicious snack, these were definitely plentiful. And if you can muster up the courage, I mean, they're pretty easy to acquire. But there was an art form to picking up the perfect meadow pie. I mean, you couldn't get one that was too ripe. You had to wait until it had dried in the sun before collecting it. And that's enough of that. Sadly, buffaloes weren't the only thing losing their lives in great numbers, as bodies were dropping left and right, but not everywhere. Contrary to popular belief, most of the West was civil, but one area sticks out from the rest, Dodge City, Kansas. The Ohio State University's Criminal Justice Research Center did a deep dive into the area during the years of 1876 and 1885, and during that time, residents had a 1 in 61 chance of meeting their end via another person's hands, or firearms. To put that into bigger numbers, that's about 165 per 100,000, and compared to the 7.8 per 100,000 from 2020, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, you can see that it was happening a bit too much. So yeah, according to the Ohio State report, even in Oregon, which had the lowest minimum rate discovered in the American West, was about 30 per 100,000 adults per year, and an adult faced at least a 1 in 208 chance of someone ending their life. I know gambling was rampant in those times, 
but I don't really like those odds. There could be a lot of time alone during the Wild West. And picture this, some people hadn't seen another person in a long time and were probably desperately craving affection from another human being. And so painted ladies, soiled doves, ladies of the night, whatever you want to call them, became rampant in a lot of towns. But the sad truth was that the industry was almost a death sentence for everyone involved. In Christopher Knowlton's book, Cattle Kingdom, The Hidden History of the Cowboy West, he took a look into the industry and showed that once women got in, there was little to no chance of getting out. Venereal diseases were rampant, and while almost all went to whatever measures were necessary to keep themselves healthy, oftentimes it just did more damage. Workers would suffer from addiction to the medicines they took, and in the end, it was often a race between all the different things to see what would end your life first. To this day, it's unclear how many lost their life due to these diseases, mainly because no one wanted to know that it was how they passed, so most certificates list other reasons. Yeah, that's not a fun time. Well, I've officially yeed my last haul. To start off, our list will be the truest danger, the one great menace. Number 10 is the Red Ghost. The stories from the 1880s of the 30-foot beast called the Red Ghost wreaking havoc in Arizona territory seemed like something of a nightmare. A heinous devil who allegedly trampled one woman and ate a grizzly bear. When miners spotted the Red Ghost and fired at it, a human skull apparently fell from the creature's back. The Red Ghost turns out was actually a feral camel. That story culminates with a farmer popping it while it ate tomatoes. You may be wondering, a camel on the American frontier? Was this normal? Is there a piece of history you are missing? No. See, in 1855, Secretary of War Jefferson Davis got it in his thick head that camels would be essential to America's westward expansion and that the wide open spaces of the west were well suited for camels. Fun fact, just because the ground is flat here and it's flat where they live doesn't make the habitat interchangeable. But this isn't about logic, it's about war camels and the government allocated $30,000 for the purchase and importation of camels to be employed for military purposes. The US Army traveled to the Middle East, purchased 75 five camels, believing they could carry supplies and personnel long distance to remote destinations. After bringing the herd of camels to Camp Verde in Texas, they were used to travel to and from San Antonio. Then the herd was split when 24 camels are sent to California for an expedition when they ate it in successfully. When back in Texas, the rest are killing the game at their camel duties. However, when the Civil War ended, soldiers and government alike had no idea what to do with the camels, so they just released them into the wild. Some were caught and then sold at auction, some were sold for race in Sacramento, others wandered down to Mexico where there's at least one account of a confederate soldier pushing a camel up a cliff, which is just so rude and unnecessary. From there, commercially imported camels began mating with the army ones and the story just gets a lot murkier as to where the camels all end up. But sightings of wild camels continued well into the 20th century. Number 9, we get to hear the twists and turns of the mystery meat. So in spring of 1874, Alfred Packer stumbled onto what is called Colorado's Los Pinos Indian Agency with a twisted tail. His five comrades, Shannon Bell, James Humphrey, Frank Miller, George Noon, and Israel Swan had made a prospecting trip in December of 1873, ignoring the advice of Chief Ore, who had told them to postpone their journey until spring, but the men ignored the advice. Lo and behold, by February, the men are out of food. Alone in the wilderness and trapped in heavy snow, they resorted to boiling their moccasins for food. After a few days, even that ran out. And that's when Bell came after Packer. Waking from a dead sleep, Packer fights off his maddened friend and self-defense, only to see that Bell had already taken out all the others, one of whom had had all the skin and muscles stripped from his leg. Packer said he's now forced to eat the meat of the others or otherwise starve, and it's only once winter passes and spring breaches that he finds his way to the closest settlement. People there did not believe him though that he hadn't been the one to take out all the other men. In April, Packer was tried in court where he was unable to prove that he hadn't except for Bell, which he claimed was self-defense, and he's sentenced. Packer, who'd already been through enough isolation, said no thanks and just vanished for nine years. When he was found, though, Packer was given a new trial in Lake City, near the site of the killings themselves, and was sentenced to 40 years in state penitentiary. He served 15 years and was released on parole. In 1950, according to the Colorado Life magazine, a hand arm was found near the campsite where the drama went down. It wasn't until 1994 it was verified as Packer's, and it had three of the five bullets missing, just like Packer said it was when he explained explained how he shot at Bell. Packer was pardoned, and today the University of Colorado at Boulder's Cafe is named for him. Just don't order the mystery meat. Number eight is the story of a famous name with a little herd title. It's Little Sure Shot. Chief Sitting Bull was the leader of the Lakota who helped defeat General George Cluster at Little Bighorn. But even the remarkably talented Sitting Bull was impressed with good old Annie Oakley's sharp shooting. In 1884, Sitting Bull was watching Oakley's perform in Minnesota and was awed by the girl 
girl being blessed by our creator with such talent. After seeing the show, the chief excitedly sent $65 to Oakley's hotel room hoping for a signed autograph, but Oakley rejected the offer. Don't worry, this isn't one of those snub things. In fact, she did the opposite. She asked him to come have a meeting with her as she was equally impressed by the man. Oakley herself later recalled, the old man was so pleased with me, he insisted upon adopting me. And that is when I was Christian with Tanya Cecilia, or Little Sure Shot. Sitting Bull and Annie Oakley would continue to get to know each other better and better as part of Buffalo Bill's Cody's Wild West show, where their relationship became one like family. He is a dear, faithful old friend, and I have great respect and affection for him, Oakley wrote. Pretty cute, feel-good story. Number seven, Rocky Mountain Oysters. Oh my sweet summer child. Do not order that off a menu if you do not know what it means, thinking you're getting your usual serving of oceanic snot rocks. This title is a fun little way for me to tell you about how in 1871, two men died over an advertisement featuring a comically well-endowed bull. See, the two proprietors of the Bull's Head Saloon get it in their heads that that image would be the perfect thing to slap on the side of their very public building at a dimension of like 20 feet by 20 feet. Yeah, no, the town flew into an outrage and enlisted the help of the city marshal, Wild Bill Hickok, to remove it. Hickok, who found it kind of funny himself like most of the men in town, tried to talk reason with, you know, women, youths, it's not appropriate, the whole mix, but the owners were adamant about their giant bull staying up, so Hickok took it upon himself to remove the mural and enrage the saloon owners in the process. In an attempt to intimidate Hickok, one of the owners told him he could keep crow on the wing. Hickok, like in a western, dramatically takes his hat off and through squinted eyes drops what would become one of the most famous sayings in the west. Did the crow have a firearm? Was he shooting back? I will be. Owners didn't take that serious. They also had never heard the whole don't attack someone whose back is to you thing because later that day when Hickok was doing his own thing, the owners very suddenly tried to pop him. Hickok, a very famous slinger, whips around and pops them both in return. This is where the story turns tragic. Seeing a figure running towards him from the corner of his eye, Hickok reactively turns and fires only to accidentally best friend, Special Deputy Marshal Mike Williams. The accident would go on to haunt him for the rest of his days. Number six is how you should definitely bring a knife to an arms fight. Oh yeah, it's my boy Geronimo, one of the most complicated uncles to ever roam the land. His true name was Goyakla, a cruel and quick-tempered type, but also traumatized and ambivalent. His contradictory yet immensely effective nature makes him one of the most fascinating characters of the Apache Wars. But long before he became the leader of the Apache, Goyakla didn't know how to use a firearm. So instead, he used a daring method to go after the soldiers who had his wife, mother, and family in a raid when he was young. Gyokla was never able to forgive this atrocity, and when he sought to ease his pain, resting deep within the lands atop Bowie Peak, he heard the voice of Usan, the ancestor, who whispered upon the wind that you will never die in battle, nor will you die by weapon. I will guide your arrows. And so it became time that Gyokla, with a spiritual Kevlar now in place, to hunt his family's vote his life to avenging them. So that's when Goyokla is duking it out with Mexican soldiers knowing the decree of his ancestor, he foregoes raining arrows upon him and instead just rushes them at full speed on horseback in a zigzag pattern to throw off their shots until he's close enough to cut them down. Goyokla steals their firearms and hightails it back to the Apache camp and this is how it became his signature pattern and also how the Apache learned to use the firearm. But how did Goyokla become, well, Geronimo? That iconic zigzag run. He repeated that pattern so so many times that the Mexican soldiers start yelling Geronimo to warn each other when he came charging. The Chiraca Apache take this as a title and began to chant the name in enthusiasm and intimidation. The real number five, medicine shows. So after a long day being gouged at the market and eating bacon cooked over buffalo poop, you'd probably want to wind down and take in a show. Now I mentioned before you could catch a cowboy show, but if you were all caught up, maybe you'd want something else. What about a medicine show? Now healthcare wasn't much to shake a stick at back then. As such, it weren't uncommon to have a quack ride on into town and start offering a miracle cure for all that ails. Just a drink of this miracle solution and watch your health improve. You see, troublesome some things like the FDA or advertising laws didn't exist way back when, so you could basically say your product did absolutely whatever and it was fine, and by God, you could put whatever you wanted in it. You've all heard the legend of where Coca-Cola gets its name, and I'll tell you, there's a reason for that. Over the years, the art of the snake oil salesman became a performance on its own, an art form, if you will. Medicine shows would have events like burlesque dancers, dogs and ponies, a pie-eating contest, all to get sales through the roof, and it worked. These doctors 
doctors would take in hand over fist. Way, way easier making money than robbing a train. You just gotta rob people blindly and tell them that you're helping them. Number four, watching a hanging. Johnny Cash shot a man just to watch him die once. If only he'd known that you could just head on out town square to watch a man die, could have saved himself those Folsom Prison Blues. In fact, I never understood why he was complaining about Folsom Prison. He put himself in there. It wasn't uncommon back then out in the frontier for a sheriff to try and swing folk into a good mood to try and make light of a bad situation. Supposedly, it boosted morale around town if you watched an outlaw hanging from a tree. And dark as this is, it was a bit of a practical thing. There weren't nearly enough lawmen to stretch across the frontier, so if someone was causing trouble, oftentimes it was a little easier to string them up and sort all that business out later. Crowds would love this too. It might seem a bit uh, grim to you and me, but this would be a whole family affair. You'd bring everybody out to come hurl insults and throw vegetables at a local horse thief, and it was less like an execution and more like a sport, you know? Good fun for the whole community that brings everybody together. Number three, drinking pork. Poison. There are few western locales or imagery even half as iconic as the saloon. Imagine them doors swinging on open, a cowboy moseying on in looking to find out who killed his paw. The kind of place you could play cards and get yourself a stiff drink. A real, real stiff drink. Because if you drank what they were drinking back then, you'd be in a ditch with your eyes rolled back in the buzzards picking at your ribs. There really were not many laws or regulations way back when when it came to what you could serve, so bartenders got real creative with what they put in their cocktails. Old West drinks had great nicknames like Cactus Poison, Coffin Varnish, Tangle Leg, which all sound mighty appetizing. Or maybe you're fixing for tarantula juice. A drink sold in Sierra Nevada, which contained actively toxic poisons and wood grain distilled from turpentine. Mm. Goes down easy with a little bit of a kick. Of course, drinking this wouldn't just have you feeling silly, but it would also give you a sensation that you had things crawling through your skin, muscle spasms, locked jaw, but hey, it's still better than drinking Mountain Dew. Number two, crooks were celebrities. Celebrity worship ain't nothing new to the United States. America's always had celebrities. Why today we might be obsessed with troublesome bad boys like Kanye West. Back then, their bad boys and celebs were thieves, killers, and all manner of crooks. Legendary outlaws like Billy the Kid inspired fans the way we talk about celebrities now. In Kid's case, someone had published a biography about him not even a month after he was cold in the ground. Outlaws were romanticized like Robin Hoods, stealing from the wealthy and giving to the poor. This perception came from the fact that most outlaws came from pretty humble beginnings and turned to crime as a means of survival. Additionally, the harsh conditions of life on the frontier led to a natural mistrust of authority, which fueled admiration for men like this who stuck it up to the law. You'd read stories about them in the newspaper and books. Heck, you'd even get trading cards and notorious crooks with a pack of cigarettes. Of course, lawman got famous too. Wild Bill Hickox was a lawman and then he went on to do all them cowboy shows. Makes a lot of sense if you really think about it. These fellas were larger than life storybook characters, except they lived in your town and you could go and shake their hands and ask them about their adventures. Of course those people would become heroes. And number one, anyone could be sheriff. When you think of the Wild West and a sheriff in particular, you might rustle up the image of a square-jawed, handsome fella in a white hat that protects the people of his town from all kinds of evildoers. Well, maybe for John Wayne and Clint Eastwood, but the truth was, sheriff was hardly the glamorous position the movies make it out to be. The sheriff was basically just a guy. Each state had their own requirements for being sheriff, and none of them really had anything to do with how equipped you were for the job. Now, many towns were rapidly expanding and needed law enforcement, but there were very few formal qualifications for such a thing. As a result, many sheriffs were frequently untrained and inexperienced, lacking any sort of skills necessary to enforce the law. In some cases, sheriffs were appointed based on their political connections, ain't that the truth? which led to all kinds of corrupt folk taking on the role of sheriff and using that power to benefit themselves. Heck, there weren't even rules about criminal records. You could very likely have a convict as your sheriff. In one infamous case in Bannock, Montana, their town's sheriff was allegedly running a conspiracy gang of stagecoach thieves on the side as a part-time gig from looking after the town. To serve and protect indeed. Whew. 
Hold on though, there was no law. That's right, how do you do a video on law when there was nothing written or upheld? After all, Constitution did not apply to unincorporated areas of the United States. The Code of the West by Zane Grey, published in 1932, revealed to us many of the unwritten rules of the West that had centered on hospitality, fair play, loyalty, and respect for the land found in the 20 years that the Wild West existed. Ramon Adams, a Western historian, explained it best, saying that back in the days when the cowman with his herds made a new frontier, here, there was no law on the range. Lack of written law made it necessary for him to frame some of his own, thus developing a rule of behavior which became known as the Code of the West. These homespun laws, being merely a gentleman's agreement to a certain rules of conduct for survival, were never written into statutes but were respected everywhere on the range. The Wild West didn't have the judicial infrastructure we have now, with extensive police forces and crime labs and so on, owing to the vast side of, of counties and territories, both of which had their own law officers, and the fact that the officers from one jurisdiction had no authority in another, many of the crimes were handled on a citizen basis as Ramon described. So a respected authority would act as judge, a jury would be made, and a case would be determined off of witness testimonies. While their world was lawless, their job was nothing but OSHA and health and safety. The cowboy code. Yes, yes, it's not a law, but to cowboys in a time where there was no law, you either followed the generalized cowboys code I'm about to share with you, or you weren't a cowboy, just a jackass on a horse. These cowboy laws existed then and they still exist strongly today. So for all my frat dudes suddenly donning Carhartt, sideburns and crap kickers because of the western fashion trends coming back in, I hope you're up to snuff with these cowboy expectations. Like for no matter how weary or hungry you are after a long day in the saddle, you always tend your horse's needs before your own and you get your horse some feed before you eat. Taking care of one's horse is a core principle of horsemanship. Hay, grain and water come before beans, biscuits and coffee. Consideration for others is central to the code, such as don't stir up dust around a cuck wagon, don't wake up up the wrong man for her duty, etc, etc. Thou shalt not steal was written in stone and cowboys tend to honor this biblical principle with conviction. It goes beyond rustling calves, swiping the boss's money belt, or liberating a man of his prized saddle. Borrowing somebody else's belongings or riding their horse without permission is not allowed. Even invading their space is generally viewed as a form of larceny. On ranches where I've worked, nobody used your stuff, said Roland Moore, a veteran Montana cowboy in a 2015 interview. Your stall in the stable was always yours. The cookhouse was a safe place, so much that you could leave your money on the table and it would be there days later. And at dinner, your spot at the table always belonged to you. That's just the way it is. And on the topic of cowboys, how about the horse and cattle hustling, the then and versus now? Back in the 1800s, the report of a Texas Ranger captain on patrol with his company in the Texas Hill County Red came upon four cattle rustlers and four heads of stolen cattle. Final cost to state, six rounds. The penalty for cattle rustling and horse theft was always death if caught red handed. No need for trial, all that was necessary was to carry out punishment. Vultures and coyotes did the cleanup. Hell, in the cowboy code I just told you guys about, it states that riding another man's horse without permission is nearly as bad as spending a night with his wife. Nowadays, charges for horses or cattle rustling still exist. In April of 2021, the RCMP executed a search warrant on a rural property in central Alberta after an investigation was launched into stolen livestock from the Caroline area. Four stolen calves were located on the property, so the landowner was hit with five counts of theft. Also, I guess he must have been a character from Trailer Park Boys because he happened to have a stolen vehicle, multiple illegal weapons, was under the influence while driving, had a bunch of substance in the vehicle, and 12 catalytic converters. So, police solved a couple other crimes in this trip. And in 2009, Bill SB 1163 was passed by Texas Senate to increase the penalty for cattle theft in Texas to 30 degree felony to dissuade the excess issue. Montana's Senate Bill 214 also passed in 2009 and it required a person convicted of theft or illegal branding of any livestock to pay a minimum fine of $5,000 and not exceeding $50,000 and serve a jail sentence not exceeding 10 years. Whether illegal hustling or a cowboy leading the way, remember, no shortcuts. Long distance cattle driving was a tradition in Mexico, California, and Texas and represented a compromise between the desire to get cattle to the market as quickly as possible, but also need to maintain the animals at a marketable weight. While the cattle could be driven as far as 25 miles in a single day, they would lose so much weight that they'd be hard to sell when they reached the end of the trail. However, sometimes shortcuts could be made, literally and figuratively. Cowboys sometimes were paid to sabotage a cattle drive or steal cattle. Sometimes they swindled cattle owners or stole the cattle themselves. Sometimes cutting through a path of land could get you somewhere faster. In these cases, it was accidental, but for many, the train in their tracks were the perfect for ridding themselves of cows. As a result of this behavior, nowadays a modern livestock code in Montana state legislature prohibits driving animals upon a railroad track. If a person 
willfully drives an animal onto the railroad track with intent to injure the corporation or the persons owning the railroad or animals, and such animal is killed or injured thereby, the person is punished by a fine not exceeding $50,000 or imprisonment in state prison not exceeding five years, or both, and they're liable for all injury and damage as caused by this occasion. A break from the animal talk will cover the West and women's suffrage. How a lack of laws in the West made it possible to limit oppressive laws against women in the East and America wide. The frontier lands weren't bound by the conventions of the eastern parts of the United States. Past the continual divide, people were expected to dispense their own justice within communities. This also meant people were no longer bound by day to day conventions of life in established towns and cities elsewhere. And by people, I mean women. Well, predominantly white women, at least, it's always being the easiest for them. Women could own property, they could work as painted ladies or as madams, but they could also be law enforcement, bounty hunters, and business owners. They could have their own home, they could divorce, or they could cross dress their way through life the way that Charlie Parkhurst did. The origins of the women's suffrage movement in America began in the West. Virtually all of the Western states enfranchised women long before the states in the East granted women the vote. Women's Christian Temperance Union was a huge leader in the women's rights across a variety of cultural, political, and social divides, leaning towards socialism and its belief that women needed legal rights in order to best fulfill their roles at home and beyond. Members of the WCTU, as well as Women of the Wild West, worked together to campaign for better working conditions, equal pay, voting rights, and end the exploitation of women. The work of the WCTU and the experiences of these Wild West women, especially indigenous women and women of color who suffered the worst at the hands of white settlers and worked the hardest despite, are important and led to the freedoms that we have now. Number five, mining. A study done at a mine in Butte, Montana found that miners were dying from tuberculosis a lot, like 10 times more than they should be. Not should be, but you get what I'm saying. The mining industry is crazy dangerous. Safety was often overlooked and the health of these miners was, well, not existent at the time. The first gold rush was back in 1799. This kicked off everything. A young man named Conrad Reed, he found this bright yellow rock. He had no idea what it was and for years he and his father John Reed actually used it as a door stopper. He had this 17 pound nugget of gold just keeping a swift breeze rolling through. It's worth a bit more than a door stopper today and this actually ended up changing the entire industry. Gold mining got so popular that Congress had to build the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina alone. It's pretty cool. You have to make a mint? That's how much money you're making? Buddy, I want a mint. Number four, law enforcement. Of course, this too was a little different back in the Old West. There are not many body cams back then, I'll tell you that for free. Movies and television, they like to show the Old West as a lawless, root and tootin' time. And while sure, some of that is true, it wasn't as terrible as we think. Like a million ways to die in the West, Red Dead Redemption, it wasn't that crazy because before any formal law enforcement agency did pop up, everybody was a bounty hunter, right? Why not? There's nothing else to do. Go lay a bunch of bricks or go catch a bad guy. 50-50, both are quite dangerous. Eventually, positions like that of a US Marshal began to pop up more and more, and well, now there's a bit more order to the system, that's for sure, a bit, just a little bit. Number three, barkeep. All right, I love pubs, big old fan of pubs. I've never been to a Wild West rootin' tootin' pub, but I'm in no rush. They always have weird drinks like venom snake juice or whatever, like spider ale. I'm like, I don't want any of these poisons. How about a beer? Just a beer, thanks. Bars in the Wild West, eh, not so fun. Not a lot of open mics going on back then in the 1800s. No karaoke night back then. See, back then, these saloons were just for business. That's it. If you don't have a mustache and a business plan, get out. In the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel. You imagine that? In the Yukon, their shot of whiskey was 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day, but if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in, I don't know, Colorado, it'd be a lot cheaper. Pretty ruthless. That's rootin' tootin' ruthless. The odd time you would have poker, dice, maybe some guy in a piano with some jazz fingers, sure, but most of the time, business only. When saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, or gamblers. If you don't have any of those three, you're thirsty. Go gamble, go grab a dice and come back. Number two, resurrectionalist. Yeah, you don't see a lot of these guys around anymore, eh? I wonder, wonder where they all went. A resurrectionalist is exactly what it sounds like. It's very gross, you're trying to bring someone back to life, I guess. Not really. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies and then they would sell them to medical schools in the West. Now, I remind you, this was the late 1820s, so yeah, it was fine, I guess. This practice began in Edinburgh, Scotland. The medical science community was on the up and up, but in order to study new medicines, you know, to avoid the next 
plague or the next toxin rolling through your system. They needed these guys to come in and do the dirty work. Today the medical community is a bit different. We're a bit, you know, smarter with things, but hey, never say never. A resurrectionalist might come back to life and be a new profession. How ironic. And finally, number one, medicinal showmen. Ah, uh, yes, we'll end on this note. Step right up and see something that doesn't work. A fake product. Yes, here we go. I'm doing a fake shoe. A fake shoot? A fake show. I don't know. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s specifically, they had what's called medicinal showmen, right? You won't believe your eyes. You have ste uh, strep throat? Come on up. Here we go. Definitely gonna fix that. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, whatever. But it was all about the pitch. That's pretty much all they had. They would have pawns, like their buddies, run ahead into town and then plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman doctor arrives, he randomly picks an ill patient that he knew was there, and then boom, just like that, he's cured. Almost like a magic show, right? Some would think, full of lies. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, and it was wildly popular. They toured with this elixir. They had to tell everybody in every town. They said it could treat any illness, but in reality, it was just a laxative. Just, uh, just a mess, just a show, really. Number 10. Boot Hill Burials. In the Old West, many towns had a boot hill, which was essentially a graveyard where outlaws and bandits and all those bad people alike were all buried with their boots on. Specifically with with those on right there. See, these cemeteries were often lacking proper markings and the dead were buried quickly, sometimes a little too quick without a coffin, reflecting the harsh and lawless nature of frontier life. It wouldn't be abnormal to see a boot sticking up out of the ground on your way home from work is what I'm saying. Today that would be quite jarring, but back then, completely normal. How yucky is that? I'm like, oh, size 11 and a half? Perfect. Number nine, medical practices. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence. Obviously, uneven roads, hopping up and down horses, everything's made of wood that's all broken. Particularly among those who worked in physically demanding professions such as ranchers, miners, and cowboys, everything is gonna be broken on your body by the end of the day. Treatment options were limited and often relied on basic first aid techniques. Splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available. Wood, cloth, animal, bones, it was nuts. It sounds crazy, but back then, it was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. You have to wrap another bone around it. It's like, ew, please, can I get a cleaner bone? Pain relief was only provided with natural remedies such as opium or willow bark tea, so. 50-50, what kind of night you're gonna have there. More serious fractures, such as those that punctured the skin, ow, those required the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, back then the doctor had like two teeth and one eye, so not much help. Number eight, duels. Ah, uh, yes, duels, let's talk about these. Duels, gotta say it all deep like. Duels were a common way to resolve disputes. Before YouTube comments, this was the only place to resolve any conflict, all right? In a traditional old Western duel, opponents would face each other often with weapons, in front of a crowd at a designated location and time. Now, most of the time, these duels would end when somebody bites the bullet. Rarely would a duel end with two gentlemen shaking hands, you know, getting over their disagreements. No, never happened. These confrontations, often over matters of honor, were deadly and a normalized part of the culture. Number seven, law enforcement. That being said, back in the day, things were a little different. Not that many body cam back in those days, I'll tell you that for free. With a lack of formal law enforcement, communities often took just into their own hands. They're like, oh yes, all 17 of us, we've decided, you're out of here. Vigilante coops would form to hunt down suspected criminals, often resulting in brutal forms of punishment without a formal trial. Yeah, no judges needed, no jury duty, nothing like that. The town ended the conflict in 48 seconds. You're welcome, let's get a beer. Let's get a really disgusting beer. Number six, public punishments. Now, when I say the town handled it, this is what I mean. We gotta go into detail here, because that's why I'm here. Public hangings were often treated as a social event, with crowds gathering to watch as if it were entertainment. How disgusting is that? They were dressed to the nines, they grabbed the whole family. People would come from miles around, sometimes with picnics, to witness this brutal punishment. Yeah, picnic. What food do you pack for a hanging? Nothing with a crunch, that's for sure. You don't wanna ruin the show for the people around you. 
Number five, Romeo and Juliet. What's it a name that which we call a rose? Any other word would smell as sweet. It's often said that art imitates life, but sometimes life can be stranger than fiction, and oftentimes really similar. The Hatfield and McCoys were two feuding families in the time of the Old West, whose hatred of one another runs deep. The most serious issues being family members removed Old West style by the opposite family, and in one case, a court battle over the ownership of a barnyard pig. But perhaps the best story to come of this feud is the love affair of John C. Hatfield and Rosanna McCoy. The two lovers met and instantly fell in love with each other, their families instantly disapproving of their newfound love. Similar to William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the star-crossed lover's story ends in tragedy. After multiple attempts to rekindle their love, including a daring rescue organized by Rosanna to free John C. from her own family, their love never re-sparked, and John C. went on to marry her cousin. It's said that poor Rosanna died of a broken heart. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves my cousin. Number four, bank robberies. If you're going to parody the wild, wild west, you need a horse, you need a hat, and you need a big sack with a dollar sign on it. Apparently, wasn't it like Bandit Central? Weren't there bank robberies on every dusty corner in every dusty old town? Uh, no, there actually was very little, in fact. Bank robberies didn't happen that often back then. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies in total. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were around 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. So it got a lot worse after the Wild Wild West. Now we're on like Wild Wild West, like 70 wilds at this point. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by famous outlaw, you may have heard of them, Jesse James and his brother Frank. This was in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. We know all these bandits, but it's like they're just, they're just robbers, they're just bad people. We shouldn't really know them or glorify them, but they do this pew, 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 and ride horses, so it's kind of fun. And the number three spot, Good Bad Town. On your way out west, you may come to find that the unsettled lands are full of danger, bandits, crooks, perilous weather and the occasional tummy ache. When the town of Palisade, Nevada's railroad was expanded and people began to arrive in droves, the town boomed, but so did their boredom. Palisade was rather mild compared to the rest of the expanding west, so much so that when tourists began to complain of Palisade being nothing like the dangerous towns they read about in their dime novels, the people of Palisade acted by staging fake bank robberies, gunfights, and even Native American battles between them and the army, with sometimes the Native Americans participating. Also going as far as using real cattle blood during the stage combat. The citizens of Palisade were such effective actors that a lot of tourists began to run back to the train in fear of what they were seeing. Nothing more American than capitalizing on boredom. Number two, Helena Duels. Have you guys heard of Helena Duels? They're pretty intense. They're a bit more intense than breakdancing battles, which honestly, it's pretty close, but these are like right above it. Helena Duels began, of course, in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth. At least that's what they called it back in the late 1800s. It still is pretty close. The Helena Duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They showed this style of combat in a pretty brutal cinematic way. Opponents' left hands were tied together with buckskin and each were given a small little blade. It had to be short enough so you couldn't reach any vital organ. That was the trick. It was a brutal detail that made this an unusual event. But just like the Romans and the Colosseum, everybody likes watching violence. Depending what era it is, people are like, yeah, we'll still show up and watch people die. Sure. People People would make bets during these duels. How did anybody watch these at all? I can't even scroll through Reddit at night without seeing something awful, let alone a Helena duel at like 4 p.m. And the number one spot. I don't like your snoring, partner. There were a handful of dangerous criminals back in the Wild West. This includes John Wesley Harden. Born to a reverend in 1853, his parents hoped he would grow up to be a preacher. He turned out to be one of the most deadliest outlaws to ever live. Harden claimed many lives over the years, but most bizarre was when he shot a man for snoring. One night in 1871, while staying at a hotel, Harden was having trouble sleeping due to the man in the next room snoring loudly. Harden promptly shouted at the man to stop snoring. Irritated with no response, he fired several shots into the next room, claiming the man's life. After years of being an outlaw and spending a lot of time in jail, he was released for good behavior, where he then received a full pardon. With his full pardon, Harden was unable to take and pass the bar exam, afterwards setting up a law practice in Gonzales County, Texas. If your lawyer has a longer criminal history than you, there's a good chance you're not gonna beat the case. Number 10, Bounty Hunter. Wanted dead or alive. The kind of thing that instills an idea of a character that would go out into the wilderness alone to hunt down criminals like Texas Cheddar over there and would be despised by all those they encountered. 
But that's not actually how it really was. You see, bounty hunters as we think of them today weren't really like that in the 1800s. Bounties were usually taken up by public peace officers, private detective agencies, or companies like Wells Fargo and Co. Many sheriffs and marshals, such as myself, Sheriff Stringbean, took up these bounties to make up for the little amounts of money they make from their day jobs. The actual term bounty hunter referred to mercenaries who would join up with an army for the bonus of enlisting. On top of that, the reward for capturing criminals like Texas Cheddar wasn't even called a bounty. It was actually called a bail. Sorry to ruin your day. Number 9. Gravedigger What does a monster truck and a weird dude from Kakariko Village have in common? If you said the foundation blocks that made up my childhood, then you win a prize. What's the prize? A big old kiss from me. Mm. In all reality though, towns in the Old West were interesting places, where there were always two constants. Sand, and folks would probably end up in the ground, or that sand. So, after the proper proceedings had taken place when someone croaked, it was time to dig a hole. Or, in these poor souls' cases, a lot of holes. Cholera outbreaks would keep a gravedigger busy for days. However, I thank the gravediggers for their service. I mean, someone had to do it. People like to give them a bad rap because they spend all their time with cadavers. That doesn't mean they're weird social outcasts. Well, except for Dompe and, and Seth from. Red Dead Redemption and well, the ones from Hamlet, those guys are pretty weird actually. Oh boy, maybe we should just keep our distance from them. I don't know, I'm getting out of here. Number 8. Saloon Owner Saloons are about as synonymous with the Old West as a single tumbleweed blowing in the wind, moving from stage left to stage right. Just about anyone could be a saloon owner too, from Festus down the street to the previous sheriff to a fancy gambler. The saloons of the Old West outnumbered churches 100 to 1, and are any of us really surprised? You'd see one general store, one doctor, if you're lucky, and then like three saloons all on the same street. It's actually probably one of the most usual jobs on this list. It was also one of the most accessible jobs, usually being what people turned to when other avenues of employment ran dry. It would even be what you did while saving up money to buy farmland or to run for your office in your government. And in a town where everyone and their moms knows you as the guy who serves the liquor, you ain't gonna have a hard time getting elected. Ah, I kind of want to be a barkeep now. Number 7. Lady of the Evening I talk about these ladies a lot, I know. Not because I want to, but because that's history, baby. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm window shopping only these days anyways. That's just the way she goes. A wise man once said, sometimes she goes, sometimes she doesn't. Way she goes, boys. When we think back and look at the Old West, you think of all the hard-working men and women who made the frontier possible. If it wasn't for those pioneers, we might not have the West Coast today. That means no vegan food. Ooh. That being said, the brothels and ladies who laid down their lives are a huge part of that history. Some brothels became so wealthy that they even would invest back in their towns, buying schools, medical buildings, that kind of thing. The truth of the matter is, no matter how greasy it might seem, it just wouldn't be the wild, wild west with a little girl power. Number six, a banker. Look, it ain't really unusual, but she gets shot at a lot. Bank robberies were not just in movies, no sir. To be a banker these days came with the territory of inviting unwelcome weapon wielding bandits to hold you up. Apart from robberies, these banks had pretty much zero regulation too, so fraud and mismanagement was pretty commonplace. It's almost safer to keep your savings in a vault at home. Almost. A lot of the time, these banks were just a couple of fellers in town who teamed up, pulled their money together, and opened a community bank. You can kind of guess how this probably wouldn't be the most trustworthy of monetary dispositories. But they were absolutely essential for some people, especially those in the cattle business where you would see around $50,000 to $100,000 exchange hands in some of those transactions. That's a lot of money back then. Heck, that's a lot of money right now. To me at least. Applications for a sugar mama will be received in the comments below. Number 5. Cowboys and Aliens Here we go. Of course, wouldn't be a Taylor McWaters list if there wasn't any alien nonsense. Long before the Roswell incident in New Mexico, which we've talked about plenty of times here, aliens may have visited us before. Yeah, old cowboy stuff. This report came from 1896, when two men in California all reported that three alien beings were trying to abduct them. Yeah, it wasn't a sighting, they were trying to like I'm like trying to grab them and pick them up. That's terrifying. He's like, take my hat. One of them was even a colonel. Colonel H.G. Shaw and Camille Spooner were both going from the town of Lodi to the Fresno Citrus Fair, which sounds like a wonderful time. Sounds like a great fair. But on route, they were greeted by seven foot tall, slender aliens. Apparently, that's pretty jarring. The aliens didn't end up taking the two men because, well, they were too heavy and well, one's a colonel, so he probably, you know, gave a nice left hook or something. But they said they fought off these aliens. That was their legit 
excuse why they didn't get abducted into outer space because two cowboys fought seven foot tall aliens. Do we buy it? I buy it, I don't know. Why would they make it up, right? They don't know what aliens look like. Nope wasn't out back then. They have no reason to lie. They're just bored going to a saloon for four days. Yeah, it's probably fake, I don't believe it. Number four, old true crime. If you're going to parody the wild, wild west, you need a horse, a hat, a big sack with a dollar sign on it, right? Wasn't it like Bandit Central back then? Weren't there bank robberies on every dusty corner and every dusty town? No, there wasn't at all. That wasn't actually a thing. This wasn't the town with Ben Affleck. That's not a thing that happened. Bank robberies didn't happen back then at all. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies in total. In total, that's it, eight. That many years, along 15 Western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States, which is a bit more. Right? Just a little bit more. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank James. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Yeah, they probably got like $14. They're like, woohoo, we're rich. Number three, kicked by a horse. Here we go. We've heard about this at some point. People are getting kicked off of horses or by horses, around horses, or bulls. That's crazy. I don't know how people run with bulls. But did it actually happen back then? Turns out getting kicked in the head by a horse back in the 1800s was like getting in a car accident today. If you have a horse, it's... The odds are significantly higher. It's probably gonna happen at some point in some way, shape, or form. Bill Pickett just sounds like a Western man already, doesn't it? Bill Pickett was born in the late 1870s and he invented the bulldogging practice, which, bear with me, sounds a little worse than it is. The practice is to jump from the back of a horse onto a wild steer. It's like, you know, I guess cowboy stuff. There's many that attempted this move, this trick. I don't know, like a trick, like it's a skateboard trick. I don't know. Many attempted this and then they failed. Yeah, it's almost like you can't wrestle a wild animal and easily live to tell about it. Weird, right? I've read it, I've seen some things. But even Bill Pickett himself got trampled and stomped to death in 1932. Holbrook Lynn, a Broadway star from the late 1800s, also met their fate from a horse accident. Imagine that, it's headlines. Malcolm Baldridge Jr., an American politician from the late 80s, rodeo accident, brutal way to go. These are wild, I did not know about a lot of these. There's so many, look into them if you want. Such a grim list. Top 10 people that have been killed by a horse, I don't know, maybe, we'll see. Number two, business in the front and also the back. I love going to a pub, right? And right as the night begins to decline, a band always appears out of nowhere, right? You're like, yes, there we go, we have a band, now we're staying for nine more hours, let's do it, we have a night. Good or bad, we love a band. Play Shout, I don't care. But bars back in the Wild West, not many bands, wasn't so fun. Not a lot of jazz going on in those saloons. Not a lot of open mics either in the 1800s. Turns out, that's uh, no fun. Back in the 1800s, these saloons were only for business. That was their sole purpose. You come in here, drink something awful, put that weird foot up, and make a deal. The odd time, sure, you'd have poker, dice to be laying around, a piano perhaps. Maybe some jazzy fingers would make their way in and quickly leave, I don't know, but it wasn't common. When saloons first popped up in Wyoming back in 1822, most of the time, it was only reserved for lawmen, miners, and gamblers. That's it. So if you walk in thirsty, they're like, eh, gamble, I guess. I don't know. That's, you're gonna have to trick your way in here. And finally, number one, the gallows. We've mentioned the gallows many times on here before, especially on Bumblebee. It's almost like humans are consistently cruel and awful to others or something. Odd. But when it comes to meeting your fate in the Wild West, well, it sounds horrible to say, but with everything else that we've heard, at least being hanged was fast. Being kicked by a horse and whatever comes afterwards, probably not so quick. And in the case of Tom Blackjack Ketchum, it was a historical death. See, after a train robbery gone wrong, Tom Ketchum was held in prison until his date with the gallows arrived. But while waiting in prison, he gained weight. This guy was eating, he was eating good apparently. He weighed around 200 pounds by the time of his demise. And dark detail here, but his body was so heavy that when he was finally hanged, his head um, left his body, it kinda like, you know, it popped off his torso. It's disgusting, but we have to end on that. I can't go from a guy losing his head 
to like camels. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. You know the saying, pick your poison? Well, in the Wild West, that phrase was oftentimes taken quite literally by saloons. One saloon in the Sierra Nevada in particular had a specialty drink called tarantula juice, which sounds disgusting as is, but only gets worse. Ingredients in this thirst quencher included but were not limited to strychnine and wood grain alcohol distilled from turpentine. So why does it have the name tarantula juice? Well, this chemical concoction would give the drinker a reaction like no other, usually involving rapid bursts of energy, along with skin crawling sensations down their arms, said to feel like tarantulas. Oh, and then they'd suffer from muscle spasms and sometimes lock jaw. In case you were curious, strychnine is a pesticide which is primarily used to get rid of birds and small mammals. But if you weren't up for it, that wasn't it when it came to dastardly drinks. Maybe you wanted to chug down some Tanglefoot, 40 Rod, Teos Lightning, Red Eye, or Coffin Varnish, made with the finest raw alcohol, burnt sugar, and chewing tobacco. Picture this, you've been out in the hot Nevada sun all day and you decide to cool off by hitting up a saloon and grabbing yourself some tarantula juice. Yeah, good luck getting anything else done today. Oh, and uh, if you said no, have fun in your bar fight. Yeehaw. Camels are very much not from North America, but they weren't once confined to zoos in the United States. In fact, during the days of the Wild West, they ravaged those who traveled through the Arizona Territory. If you think about it, there's no animal that would make traversing through the desert easier than a camel. The only hitch? There ended up being so many that once they realized that they couldn't take care of that many, they set them free into the wild, where they're not from. But not all of these camels suffered the same fate. And just a heads up, you won't like where this is going. There are reports of camels shoved off of cliffs, fighting for the Confederates, and ravaging through people's lawns until each and every one was captured at best and sold at auction but there was one camel who stood out from the rest its name red ghost it's confirmed to have ended the life of one and came close with others it was also rumored to stand 30 feet tall one eyewitness claims they saw it devour a grizzly bear this dangerous beast roamed the arizona territory for years and no one knows exactly why it was so angry or dangerous but when a rancher named eagle creek hit it with his rifle the wild west breathed a sigh of relief because they knew the Red Ghost was gone. Now you might think that the rampant duels and willy-nilly firing of firearms, that the number one cause for someone to lose their life in the Wild West was by bang through their chest. I mean, Red Dead Redemption would have you thinking that, but instead of a bullet, it was something else going through the body, sickness. And while a bullet can only take one life at a time, unless you're really talented, cholera could take multiple, and that it did. And it came from something everybody needs, water. While those in the Wild West knew how to get disinfectant for diseases such as cholera, it wasn't all that easy getting your hands on it. And if you weren't fighting cholera, it could have been smallpox, dysentery, measles, pneumonia, scurvy, or mountain fever. And while yes, there was the beginning of some modern medicines around that time, most physicians weren't accessible to it. And so more common remedies included leeches, cold baths, blistering agents, and other remedies that science has no proof of being effective. Around this time, snake oil salesmen started popping up as well. And as you're about to find out, they were quite profitable. Now look here, would I ever lie to you? For the low price of $20, this oil will rid you of everything that troubles you. Come on, give it a try. And if you believe me, congrats. You purchased snake oil. So what was snake oil? Well, it was the new hip craze in the Wild West, as many cultures in Asia had used it for years as medicine, and so with the influx of immigrants from those countries, with them came the snake oil. While there's no genuine scientific evidence that snake oil helps in any ways, cowboys were trusting, and in a time where they were looking for anything to help with the multitude of illnesses, they turned to these remedies. For as much as we know snake oil now is a scam, I mean, it's synonymous with the term, we have to give a little bit of credit to the marketing geniuses behind it. And just a little bit, not a lot, yet that's enough. And think about the cultural impact that snake oil has had. I mean, it even spawned a show with David Spade. And uh, I'd say that's pretty huge. Now here's one of the trickiest parts about living in the Wild West. You gotta get there. And if you're traveling with a group, yeah, odds are not all of you are gonna make it. Now I don't know if any of you have played the electric fast paced game known as the Oregon Trail, but here's a shocker. It was based on the real Oregon Trail and the road was just as treacherous. Britannica believes that around 40,000 people traveled along the path from the 1840s to the 1860s and about one in 10 didn't complete the journey. You'd have to deal with dehydration, starvation, diseases, harsh weather, rattlesnake bites, and usually it would stem from one thing. Oops, uh, your cart is broken and now you're stuck. Good luck being alone without any significant means of transportation in the middle of the desert. You've only got a couple days of food and haven't seen another person for miles. Decision time. Now imagine how easier it would be if they had an ATV or a car. And now a silly little interlude, the measure of a man should not be his ability to toss back some beers. After all, what constituted a man being old enough to belly up to the bar in the Wild West? Usually it was the judgment of the proprietor or the bartender. You guys know the one where they 
they kind of look at you and they do the up and the down and the, you get all anxious. Billy the Kid was hanging out in saloons by the time he was 18. Billy Clanton was doing the same even before that. There are endless records of our most famous cowboys and outlaws getting tanked on the regular from a young age. But why? First off, alcohol was more common because it was a lot safer than water. Alcoholic drinks kept longer and it was easier to transport. It's been this way since medieval times, so no shock value in that. Beer was rocking a typical 1 to 2 percent ABV, and it was the closest thing to portable water. When they were actually drinking to drink, though, spirits was the choice, coming in at about 15 percent ABV in the late 18th century, compared to our modern day 40 percent ABV. Uh, one other thing, oh yeah, youth having a struggle or having an exposure to alcohol was a big reason that prohibition was finally approved. You know how a bunch of women were upset that their husbands came home drunk every day and that's how prohibition got its ball rolling? Well, the men grew up in this era, or at least their fathers and grandfathers did, and as we know, addiction's not only a, but a genetic one, so even if they didn't partake themselves at a young age, their parents might have. This intergenerational trauma was inflicted by excess alcohol consumption in the Wild West and survived well into the more smoke and factories prohibition era. And let's talk about the law of the wanted poster, dead or alive. That can't be literal or real, right? Could you actually kill someone legally as long as it was the government poster with a cheeky red stamp on it? To answer your first question, yes, there are many known instances such as dead or alive posters being put up by the state or other entities, but it wasn't a get out of jail free card to kill the person without legal consequences. For example, Jesse James's death, Charlie and Robert Ford kill him, their own pal, but they went to collect the bounty and were jailed and put to death because witness testimony stated Jesse was unarmed, not resisting, and willing to go with them. To get away with killing a wanted person, they needed to be resisting in some kind of way, particularly in a way that threatened your life, aka self defense, which wouldn't have been any different than if somebody attacked you outside of a bounty scenario. For quite some time in the US history, it was legal to use a deadly force against a fleeing felon, even if your own life wasn't immediately threatened. The logic behind this was seemingly that chasing down a fleeing person could be dangerous in unforeseen ways. It also incentivized criminals not to flee in the first place. These wanted posters still exist today and are used by associations such as the Mounties or the FBI or even the Supreme Court. A wanted poster can be a very important tool in seeking a fugitive. It allows law enforcement to make the public aware of a wanted person, multiplying the number of eyes focused on finding them. How do you get rid of indigenous people and pull tourists? Bison extermination mandates. Just to try and imagine the old west with no billboards, no power lines, fresh clean air, open fields, nothing in the way of massive herds of bison. If there's anything to be said about the Americas, it's when we've ruined something, we ruin it in full force. Bison, with an estimating range of 10 to 30 million, roamed America in the early 1800s. Then the Pacific Railroad was completed that opened up the west to a whole different kind of person, who were adventurous but still wanted to sit in a comfortable chair the whole time. Railroads would advertise hunting excursions in which paying customers would climb atop the train cars and aim down at the bison running alongside the tracks. No work involved, no danger for themselves, and hundreds of thousands of bison corpses are left to rot where they fall. One disgusting pig of a man, or Orlando Brick Bond, is credited with killing thousands himself. But the truth is, most of them were killed by the people commissioned by the United States Army or the Army itself on their orders to do so. The American buffalo was a primary source of food and hide for indigenous people, and the United States wanted to wipe us out. So they went after the buffalo in the 1830s, and by the early 1900s, there's less than a thousand left. Kill every buffalo you can. Every buffalo is a dead Indian gone, one colonel said during a hunting expedition. The policy was if you saw a buffalo as a soldier, you were obliged to kill it. And now for how the West brought us the misfortune of botch, rinse, then reform. A death sentence is something most of us won't have to face in our lifetime, if you're lucky or not a terrible person at least. And a botch death sentence occurs when there's a breakdown in protocol. And that involves an unanticipated problems or delays that cause, or at least arguably cause, unnecessary pain for the prisoner or that reflect just gross incompetence of the executioner. It's an estimated that 3% of the US death sentences from 1890 to 2010 are botched, with the hemp necktie coming in at first. The tension of the rope or the strength is right. They were using a generalized scale that resulted in some hellish endings. The death of Tom Horn was retold in the saga of Tom Horn and he was sentenced to death, but the method used to relieve him ended up with him suffocating for 17 minutes. The opposite happened to Black Jack, aka Tom Ketchum, the last man to be roped for train robbery. He fell too far, ending his life with decapitation. The New York Times says a reliable formula for determining the drop wasn't published till 1913, and with it came more
more humane standards for pre-death sentence, and the Wild West is actually the origin of prisoners getting to choose their last meal as well. And finally, no deathly duels is last in the countdown. Public offender, legislator, lawyer. Each of these professions needs to take an oath stating that they have never fought a duel with a deadly weapon if they want to work their job. In section 228 of the state's constitution, there remains a famous dueling clause. Since 1891, the Commonwealth officials have had to swear or affirm that they've never been in a duel in or out of the state or acted as a sect. Now why do we have that law still today? Well in 1777, a group of Irishmen decided that the various rules and regulation of dueling published in European novels should be brought together in an updated manual, Code Duello. Featuring 26 rules for civilized duels, America won its independence from Great Britain in 1783. The newly reformed United States took a dim view on dueling. George Washington abhorred the practice. Benjamin Franklin said duels constituted as a horrible practice, but that didn't stop anyone. Button Gwinnett, who signed the Declaration of Independence, died in 1777 from a duel, and Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers, died in a duel. By the first decades of the 19th century, dueling increased among the American upper classes. A new, more American version of the Code Duello, written by a Southern Carolina governor, Lyde Wilson, appeared in 1838. Knowledge of the code became part of the fashionable young gentleman's life, and with such history of, of glorification of weapons, it's no wonder that the state's fourth and present constitution retained the seemingly archaic clause against dueling. Kentucky lawmakers felt that an official statement in the Commonwealth's highest legal document banning would-be elected officials from participating in duels would send a powerful message to those who might still resort to violence to settle disputes. First up, let's meet Pearl Hart. And let me start by saying that there's like three pearls on this list. Wild West was a big fan of that name. And Pearl was a big fan of the Wild West. She was born in Canada around 1870, and by 17 she was married to a gambler and on the train to the Americas, running from her terrible father in a life of disguising herself as a boy to commit thefts to scrape by. At 22, she attempted to divorce said husband to pursue further opportunities in the West. A total ride or die dandy, Pearl's husband upped his life to chase her down, and when he found her, Pearl was already living it up with cigarettes, liquor, and even morphine. He won her back, but only before being drafted. After her husband left to fight in the Spanish-American War, Pearl, who was using her old cross-dressing ruse to commit thefts and crimes alike, met a man named Joe Boot, who was a career criminal. They robbed stagecoaches for a while before she was caught and jailed. Hart is famous for saying, I shall not consent to be tried under a law in which my sex had no voice in making. She was eventually released, the jail having helped her find sobriety, new skills, a career, and how to read and write. But the rest of her life is kind of unknown. America was shocked and thrilled by the idea of a female outlaw, and Pearl earned endless infamy from the age of 19. And newspapers clamored for interviews with Hart, while Cosmopolitan, a new magazine at the time, was obsessed with her and often sent reporters to try and get quotes out of her. The Old West never saw another woman like her. And Pearl wasn't the only one taking advantage of male privilege. Meet Charlie Parkhurst. And from 1812 until their death in 1879, nobody knew Charlie was biologically a woman. There's no official documentation on what Charlie identified as personally. If they felt themselves to be a woman or non-binary or transgender, we'll never know. The story goes that while in the poorhouse as an orphan, Charlie discovered that boys have a great advantage over girls in the battle of life, and they desired to become a boy because of it. But what we do know is that times were rough for ladies in the Wild West, so this Cracker Jack stagecoach driver decided to live most of their life as a man, driving stages for Well Fargo and the California Stage Company, pulling cargoes of gold over tight mountain passes and open desert. At constant in danger from rattlesnakes and desperados. But Charlie had the balls for it. They're remembered as short and stocky, a hard drinker, cigar smoker, and tobacco chewer who wore an eye patch after being kicked in the left eye by a horse, thus their nickname one Eye Charlie. Using their secret identity, Charlie was also a registered voter, and meaning they may have been the first American woman to ever cast a ballot, and nobody knew. After stagecoaching, industry began to die due to the railroads. Charlie lived out the rest of their life raising cattle and chickens until their death in 1879. It was then that their true identity was revealed, much to the surprise of their brooding and brutal friends. And then it was documented to the world in newspapers, many of which actually appreciated who they'd been in their secret, instead of belittling them in death. I'm sure Charlie would have loved to see that and know that. She's who you'd see in these old western films, Josephine Sarah Marcus. A smolderingly good looking actor, born in 1861, Marcus ran away to Tombstone, Arizona while touring with a theater group performing Gilbert and Sullivan's HMS Pinafore. 
She stuck around to marry Sheriff John Banham. But two years later, when notorious criminal Wyatt Earp showed up, well, her marriage went cold very coincidentally as she got all hot over tall, dark, and handsome Earp. Josephine and Earp fell in genuine love, and she'd supposedly be the reason behind the famous duel at the OK Corral, a 30 second flurry of gunfire involving the Wild West superstars Doc Holliday, the Clayton brothers, and of course, the Earps. He, unlike many, was unbothered and actually more intrigued by her Jewish heritage. The Earps lived an OK life once they settled a bit, moving between mining and oil camps, and eventually California to promote a movie about Wyatt Earp's lawman exploits. Unfortunately, Wyatt passes away before this is accomplished, leaving Josephine to battle it out with the studios and writers who take the original biography and turn it upside down. A commercialized depiction of her husband and an unflattering portrayal of her is released called Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshal. It came out in 1931 and fueled 50 years of Wyatt Earp mania, pro and con in print and film. Until she died, Josephine worked hard to have the correct documentation of her beloved life released. She passed away in 1944 and claimed until her dying day that Wyatt Earp was her one and only true love. Here's another one, Pearl DeVere. She is one of the most famous madams in history. This red haired siren was born in Indiana around 1860 and made her way to Colorado during the Silver Panic of 1893. DeVere told her family she was a dress designer, but in fact rose to fame as the Old Homestead, a luxurious brothel in Cripple Creek, Colorado. The price of a night's stay could cost patrons $250, which at the time was insane, but more so in comparison to how most hotels at the time charged about $3 a night. The building was reportedly equipped with an intercom system and boasted fine carpets, imported furniture and drinks, and chandeliers. As beautiful as she was sharp, the Rose of the Wild Bunch. Daughter to Germanic mother and Native American father, Laura Bullion faced discrimination and inability to fit in right away. But that's okay, she followed her father in the footsteps of career criminal. And while working as an escort in Texas, she becomes involved with Will Carver, who had been her married in uncle until her aunt's recent demise. Now widowed, Carver took 15 year old Laura to Utah with him, where he begins working with Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch in 1898, as does Laura. Laura Bullion helped the gang by fencing goods and money for them and was known to the group as Della Rose and often called the Rose of the Wild Bunch. Her affections also turned to Bill Kilpatrick, a member of the group, and they became lovers. Having taken part in several train robberies with the Wild Bunch, Kilpatrick and Bullion returned to Texas with William Carver, where Carver was ambushed and killed by lawmen on April 1st of 1901. Bullion and Kilpatrick then fled to St. Louis, Missouri, where they were arrested on November 8th of 1901. Kilpatrick was found guilty of robbery and sentenced to 15 years in prison, while Laura was sentenced to five. After serving three and a half of those years, Laura was released from Missouri State Penitentiary at Jefferson City, Missouri on September 19th of 1905 and lived the last years of her life in Memphis, Tennessee, under the name Freda Lincoln, where she was a seamstress and a dressmaker. She passed away on December 2nd, 1961, and is buried in Memphis under a tombstone that reads Freda Bullion Lincoln, Laura Bullion, the Thorny Rose. Number five, the gold rush. Picture a billboard for the wild, wild west, okay? What's on it right now? A cowboy tipping his hat in the corner with you know four missing teeth, a sunset in the corner obviously, maybe a horse, and also a bunch of gold stacked up in a mine, right? Well, we've heard about the wild west here and there, but was there really a massive gold rush? The California gold rush of 1849, despite what history commonly believes, wasn't the first big gold rush, not even close. The first one was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock right on his property. He had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, used this rock as a doorstopper. You already know where I'm going with this. This 17 pound nugget of gold, which is worth a lot even today, back then this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right after. Then later in 1828, more gold was discovered, but this time in Georgia. This was the second rush. Then come 1848, James Marshall found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. After the third one though, that's when the thousands moved out west. That one had the biggest pull. So it's pretty big, but not the first. Number four, the OK Corral. The shootout at the OK Corral went down on October 26, 1881. It's known as the most famous shootout in history. But should it be, really? Going back to Tombstone, Arizona, it's 3 p.m. and we have men of the law and of course outlaws all in the same block. So naturally, trouble ensues. There's not enough land here for all of us, some rootin' tootin' shit. There were about eight men involved in the rumble, but it barely lasted 30 seconds. Also, it's important to note the gunfight at the OK Corral wasn't even at the OK Corral. It happened near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street, right behind the corral. 
Yeah, details matter. Three lawmen were injured and three cowboys lost their lives. Yeehaw. That's a sad yeehaw for you guys. This is why you don't organize shootouts at 3 p.m. I don't know, everyone's drunk, there's bad decisions, apparently there's bad aim. Just slam some milk, shake some hands, go home. Simple. Number three, Helena duels. So we talked about the bizarre ways folks would settle beef back then. They would slam tarantula juice and shoot animals from the top of locomotives, have a 30 second fist fight in the middle of the day and then go home. But have you heard of these Helena duels? It began of course in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth, at least it was back in the 1800s. The Helena duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They show this style of combat in a pretty brutal, Hollywood way. Both opponents had their left hands tied together with buckskin and then each were given a small knife with an even smaller blade. It had to be short enough so it didn't reach any vital organ. That was the Texas trick. Then they're whirled around until they're dizzy and then it gets really loud, really messy and really bloody. Last man standing, pretty much. The crowd of course watches and places bets which is always insane to me. I can't watch UFC sometimes. I don't like seeing things break, let alone a Helena duel. Catch me inside sipping milk, texting my ex. Hard pass, freaks. Number two, train games. Entertainment was always a hit or miss when it comes to these historical lists. The Romans held gladiator battles with animals that drew in thousands of spectators from across the land. Well, in 1894, William Crush, a railway man, had this event in mind that would for sure go down in history. Oh buddy, did it ever. William Crush wanted to secure the future of the railroad company in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. And to do so, William made an entire temporary city appropriately named the city of Crush. Nice. There was a carnival for children to enjoy and all that jazz, but the main pull for adults was the train smash. The collision of two 40 ton steam trains was meant to be the talk of the town. Look at these goliaths as they smash, or I mean crush, haha, <laughs> into each other. How fun. Yeah, the trains collided, it worked, and the darnest thing happened, um, they blew up. Yeah, it's almost like they caused a disaster for popularity, neat. 40,000 came in and many left injured. A couple of people sadly didn't leave at all. One survivor ended up getting 10 grand out of the deal. His name was JC Dean and they lost their eye in the explosion. So the company gave them a lifetime railway pass. Just the thing you want right after that horrific event. Sorry about your eye. Here's free PTSD as well. Anytime you want, enjoy. Crush was later rehired by the railway after it gained popularity. Yeah. This it happened back then too. Somebody does something horrible and then now all of a sudden they're famous. Hashtag chair girl. Starting our list off at number 10, no bar stools. This one here is for all the bartenders out there. Okay, bar seating is vital when you go out. It's the first thing that you see when your random party of 12 arrives and then asks for spots all of a sudden. So it's a little jarring to imagine a world where you couldn't sit down at a local pub. Yeah, standing room only. That's it, don't lock those knees or get too comfortable. You get your regulars coming in often, right? You got Karen with the limp, she's so nice, she's awesome. Imagine if she had to stand up the entire time. No way, get out of here. We have a booth just for her all the time. She always gets a grilled cheese, so nice. Back in the Western days, bar stools weren't a thing. In the 1800s, you couldn't sit and vent to your local barkeep about why your ex hasn't texted you back. No, that wasn't a thing. They didn't have stools at the bar, nothing, just one rail. Just a bar rail to put your foot on and then have a weird balance the whole time. That's great, that's awesome. I feel like a cowboy already. Just a nice cowboy lean, that's comfortable. I'll eat fish and chips standing up, I guess. Let's move on. Number nine, medicinal showmen. Back in the wild west, I mean from the 1860s, from the 1890s really, they had these medicinal showmen and it's exactly what you think. It's ridiculous. Step right up, you won't believe your eyes. Cough syrup. Crazy, right? So these guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, but they would really nail the pitch. I mean, that's all they had back then. There was no science to back them up. There's no Yelp reviews. They would have pawns instead, like their friends, run ahead into town and plant themselves in the audience before these random medicine shows. That way, when the world's greatest showman, doctor arrives, whatever, he randomly picks an ill patient and then boom, just like that, they would be cured. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made by John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, root, and animal fat. It was said to treat any illness, but in reality, it was only a laxative. What a fun show that is. Step right up, not, not that close. Trust me, not that close. Number eight, 
Camels? That's right, we're not riding horses, we're riding camels. We got room for two people, depending on the amount of humps. I know they have one or two, depending on which, all right. In 1855, the United States Army decided to import 75 camels into Texas. Yeah, why not? After all, the train in the Old West was fairly similar to the Middle East, so I guess it made sense. The camels made supply runs between Camp Verde and San Antonio, but trouble began when an American Civil War broke out. Yeah, a little bit of a thing happened there. Now eventually the camels were sold off or simply let go into the wild where they multiplied and began to cause havoc and then so on and so forth. So much so that folks began to spin urban legends such as the red ghost, which was a 30 foot tall creature that made people quiver in their you know, britches or britches. I don't know what they say, jeans or pants? Whatever's Western, the Western version of pants. Trousers, that's British. Trousers is definitely British. It's not a cowboy at all. When in reality, it wasn't a monster, it was just a camel. But yeah, camels can be pretty frightening when you see just a silhouette. Again, with the two humps, it looks like a monster, for sure. I was a kid, I went on a camel ride once and I cried. Never doing that again. Also, that's pretty cruel. I'm not riding a camel. Number seven, going the distance. First things first, how much was an IPA back in the 1800s, right? What's this gonna cost? Some beers today are wild. I live downtown Toronto, it's crazy. Every bar I go into, it's insane. It's like $13 to get an IPA. It's like Gary's Rootin' Tootin' IPA. A pint made in-house with this bare feet. Tastes like a cup of nickels. Not a fan, not a fan of the IPA game. Today we have happy hour specials, wine pairing suggestions to go along with your meal, a lovely wine sommelier to aggressively tell you which bottle to get. But back in the 1850s, saloons would price their drinks depending on how far away you had to travel just to get them. Yeah, what a weird system, right? In the Yukon, for example, their shots of whiskey were 50 cents a pop. Now, that was a lot back in the day. So if you were to ask for the same drink in a local saloon, say in Colorado, well, it'd be a lot different, it'd be a lot cheaper. If you kick the saloon doors open and you're out of breath, well, it's very clear that you've traveled a long way. Hey, this guy's out of breath. Let's charge him double for all of his troubles. Why not? Let's go, get off the floor. So out of breath, he's like, give me some water. How do they kick open saloon doors? They would just swing right back. They're not ideal doors to kick open. Number six, missing mines. There's billions of dollars worth of gold just lost at the bottom of the ocean. That's fun, it's out there right now, waiting for you to go and get it. Right after you click that thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Right after you do those things, go and find that gold for us. But if swimming isn't your thing, eh, no problem. Try the West, plenty of gold out there. There's dozens of lost treasure troves just hidden in mines, like the San Saba gold mine, for example, or the wheelbarrow mine, for example, or more that I'm not gonna name because, well, maybe I'll go check them out myself, I don't know. None compare to the Dutchman mine. That one is very special. Now, this legend has it that a man named Jacob Waltz, a German prospector, he found the richest gold mine in the world. Now, that's what he told his friends. And would we ever lie to our friends about gold? No, never, okay? I certainly wouldn't. It's definitely real, man, for sure. First gold rush was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this big, shiny, yellow rock. He had no idea what it was. And for years, he and his father, John Reed, used it as a door stopper. Yeah, the 17 pound nugget of gold. He just grabbed it, threw it on the floor, and then held his door open all day. Hey, come on in, here's company. Watch your foot over that big stupid rock. Back then, this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina. Cause yeah, people started to catch on how much it was worth. Put that in my pocket, thanks. Number five, comfort of the ladies of the evening. Now being that it's the old west and there was just a shootout in the street, folks need to take their minds off of such horrors. Add into the mix long hard days, tending fields and livestock, people need to take off some steam. The local saloon is there for that. However, like a hidden menu at McDonald's, there's some other activities a man can engage in that aren't perhaps a regular service. Aw, oh, who the hell am I kidding? Ladies of the evening were quite common back then, actually. Naturally, it was a very dangerous job. However, if anything good can come from that, it's that in some cases, these women became very wealthy, wealthy enough to become the madam of their own establishments. And in some other cases, these madams were using their wealth to invest back into their towns, like building schools, doctor's offices. Imagine getting treatment from something and the doctor says, these bandages were brought to you by Madame Dover's Wicked Wizard Vacuum Double Sloshy Slush 9000. It's a great product, what can you say? Number four, interior decor. We've seen a Western saloon in movies. More often than not, it's the swinging door. You know, the classic, they always kick it in, boom, and dust everywhere and all over the place. Dust gets all on people's meals, the classic. You sort of need to kick those doors open, kind of, also. Because if you go through slow, it's just weird. It like pushes your clothes back. You need that cowboy momentum. 
In reality, there weren't a lot of swinging saloon doors. In fact, most saloons across the West were in pretty rough shape. They didn't look like a Tarantino set at all. They looked like that one pub in that one town that one time, you know? Just not clean, not clean at all. You ride by, you're like, is that still open? How is that still open? These saloons were tiny rooms. We had stools or chairs made of fur. You know, no one's running fish tacos to tables in the 1850s. It doesn't always smell like a nice pub. You don't see something go by and you go, ooh, what's that? I wanna have that. No, that doesn't happen here. One of the fanciest saloons has to be the White Elephant in Fort Worth, Texas. It was two stories and it served fresh fish and oysters. Apparently it was a lovely time. Number three, manifest destiny. The destiny of America. There's a famous poster somewhere. It's like an angel guiding the pioneers west. It's like pointing, doing something like that. Back to the history. What is manifest destiny? Well, for our non-American audience, it was this very core belief that since America had won its independence and begun expanding west, that they were destined to do so and keep expanding. Man expanding. Why should the freedom train stop here, right? Coast to coast, baby. And maybe buy Alaska from Russia, since, well, they're not really using it. Okay, and maybe Hawaii. They, they got pineapples or something, I don't know. All right, maybe even heavily influenced places that are beyond US borders. But all that American influence and imperialism starts here. Imagine being the pioneer who dared to venture west, like the Great Oregon Trail, or those who crossed the desert states. And some really religious folks that found a salty lake in the desert looked at their wives and said, eh, I need at least two or three more. God bless America. Number two, mixologist. You ever go to a pub, like a chill pub, dare I say a restaurant, and a dude with a mustache thinks he's in Peaky Blinders for no reason behind the bar? He's flipping bottles that don't need to be flipped. He's lighting shots on fire. Guy, it's 12.45 in the afternoon. What's your soup of the day? Where did this come from, historically? Where did the cool bartender role come from? I'm trying to order a Cosmo, but he won't stop doing stunts. In the 1800s, bartenders were referred to as mixologists. <sighs> Uh, they were top dog. They had to be. They were the fanciest guys in town. We're now doing impressions of these guys today, you know, with the bow tie and we pour it in fancy ways, because around the late 1800s, saloon owners were growing rapidly. So now you needed to have something special, something unique for the town. Like, say, a witty mixologist who can twirl his mustache as he pours a drink without looking. Great, now the town feels special, it feels unique. Manuals for bartenders came out around the 1860s, that's when things started to get more serious. A gentleman named Jerry Thomas published a guide called How to Mix All Kinds of Plain and Fancy Drinks. Today we still have that, but now it's a red sticky binder that says meal specs and sharpie. It's not as fancy, but it gets the job done. Number one, dysentery. Nothing is more horrible, more awful than catching dysentery. Trust me, I would know. I never caught it, I just, sometimes I get diarrhea. Anyway, in Oregon Trail, the very charming DOS game. Gotta love that DOS color palette. Eye melting scion and violet, nice. This text-based adventure game, however, is grounded in some truth, as we can all imagine this wasn't a time of great cleanliness. Dysentery, typhoid, cholera, malaria, or more commonly known as yellow fever, and even scurvy, which you usually associate that with pirates, but cowboys got it too. Which, given the conditions of the Old West, makes for a not so fruit friendly environment. So yeah, it does make sense. Sadly for cowboys, prospectors, and everyone in between, there was a good chance you would lay down with a headache and then the rest of your posse would have to lay you down forever. In the ground, partner. Number 10, Pearl Hart. Pearl Hart was a notorious figure in the American Wild West, known for involvement in a stagecoach robbery. Her life story is often intertwined with the tales of the Old West and the outlaws who sought adventure and fortune during that era. Pearl Hart, whose real name was Pearl Taylor, was born in Canada in 1871, but was later moved to the United States and became involved in various activities, including acting and singing. In 1899, Pearl Hart and a companion, Joe Boot, decided to rob a stagecoat in Arizona. The stagecoat was in en route from the globe to Florence carrying passengers and valuables. The stagecoach robbery did not go as planned as Pearl Hart and Joe Boot were not experienced criminals and their attempt was somewhat amateurish. They failed to obtain a significant amount of loot and after the failed robbery, Pearl and Joe was captured by law enforcement. They were then later arrested and brought to trial and Pearl Hart and Joe Boot were tried for their crimes. During the trial, Pearl presented herself as a victim of circumstances, arguing that she had committed the robbery due to personal circumstances. She was convicted and sentenced to only five years in prison. As for Joe, nobody knows. Pearl 
Nicole's heart's life after her release from prison remains somewhat of a mystery. After serving about two years of her sentence, she was released due to good behavior, and Pearl Hart's belief was dramatic stint as a stagecoat robber contributed to her lasting notoriety as the annals of Wild West history. Her story became a part of a lore surrounding outlaws and characteristics of American frontier. Number nine, Laura Bullion was also known as the Rose of the Wild Bunch. She was a female outlaw associated with the Wild Bunch gang, a notorious group of American outlaws led by Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid during the late 19th and early 20th century. Laura Bullion was born in Knickerbocker, Texas in 1876. Her family moved to the mining town of Moab, Utah where she grew up. Laura became acquainted with the members of the Wild Bunch including Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid and then other notorious outlaws. She developed a romantic relationship with Kid Curry, a member of the gang, and Laura Bullion participated in various criminal activities with the Wild Bunch including train and bank robberies. She was also known for her sharp shooting skills and her involvement in the gang's illegal enterprises. In 1901, Laura was arrested in St. Louis, Missouri for her involvement in a train robbery. She was sentenced to five years in prison but only served about three, and after her release from prison, Laura Bullion tried to lead a more law-abiding life. She lived under an assumed name in Memphis, Tennessee, working as a housekeeper. Laura Bullion then passed away on December 2nd, 1961 in Memphis, Tennessee at the age of 85, and her death was largely unnoticed by the public. Number eight, there is a limited historical information about Belle Sidions, who is also known as Madame Vestal. She was a figure associated with the American Old West during the late 19th century, particularly in the realms of entertainment and the infamous red light districts of frontier towns. Belle Sidions was reportedly an entertainer and an actress who performed in various theatrical productions and shows during the late 1800s. But later in her life, Belle Sidians adopted the alias Madame Vestals and became known for her role as Madame, managing establishments and red light districts. These areas were known for housing brothels and establishments that provided various forms of entertainment. During the late 19th century, the American West would experience rapid growth with numerous people seeking fortune and adventures in newly settled areas, as well as red light districts. The presence of the red light districts, saloons, and entertainment venues catered to the needs of this transient population that was very common. Like many individuals associated with the red light districts of the Old West, the details of Belle Sidian's life remain somewhat elusive and separating the fact that a legend can be challenging. Nevertheless, figures like Madame Vestals contribute to the colorful and diverse tapestry of the Old West societal history. Number seven, Rose Dunn, also known as the Rose of the Cameron, was a legendary figure associated with the American Old West. Born in 1878, Rose Dunn gained notoriety for her romantic entanglements with outlaws and her involvement in the activities of the Wild Bunch Gang. Hmm. Rose Dunn was also born in Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma in 1878. She came from a large family, and her brothers were also known for their involvement in outlaw activities. Rose Dunn then became romantically involved with George Bitter Creek Newcomb, a member of the Wild Bunch Gang led by Bill Doolin. The Wild Bunch was notorious for its involvement in train and bank robberies, as we know. In 1895, a shootout occurred in the Dunn family ranch involving lawmen seeking to capture Dunn brothers and their associates. During the confrontation, Rose's brother John Dunn was killed, and her older brother George Dunn was captured after the death of Bitter Creek Newcomb. Rose Dunn then lived more of a settled life, and she married Charles Albert Noble, a farmer, and they had a family. Rose and Charles lived in Catheridge, Missouri. Rose Dunn then passed away on February 5th, 1955, in Parachute, Colorado. Number six, Sarah Jane Newman was born in Tennessee in 1817 and later moved to Texas. Also known as Sally Skull, or Sally Skull, was a figure associated with the Texas frontier during the mid 19th century. Her life story involves elements of violence, crime, and romance, contributing to her notoriety in the history of the American West. Sarah married George Washington Skull, a Texan and a participant in the Texan War of Independence. George Skull operated a ferry and owned a ranch in a location known as Skull Crossing in the San Antonio River. The crossing was an important point for travelers and cattle drives as the Skull family became involved in violent feuds with the Taylor family over land and cattle. This feud escalated and resulted in several killings on both sides. With also casualties in 1867 during the height of the feud, Scally Skull was widowed after her husband George Skull was killed. Following his death, she sought out revenge and killed several members of the Taylor family. And after the killing, Sally Skull was captured and imprisoned. She was definitely tried for the deaths, but was charged or dropped due to insufficient evidence. And after her release, Sally Skull's life became less eventful as she lived in relatively obscurity and passed away in 1888. Number five, gambler. You gotta know when to hold them, know when to fold them, and know when to walk away. Anyone who spends time in front of a slot machine will tell you that it can be a dangerous game. Many have claimed to want it big, all whilst envelopes with red print pile up at the front door. Final notice? Pfft, that means another spin, baby! Well, this is a similar story of the Old West, but instead of a one-armed bandit, there were actual bandits with two arms uh, and guns. <laughs> Yikes! It's a game of poker, lies, bluffs. Playing the wrong hand could wind up turning sour. The gamblers are the type of guys who roll into town in the shiniest clothes and stay in the best places. And right before you notice you've been cheated at the poker table, he's already cashed out. Number four, milliner. Hey, I have a proposition. So we have hats for men, right? Now, 
What if we implore someone for the sole purpose of, get this, making hats for women? Well, Jebediah, uh, we have that. That would be the uh, milliner down the road there. If you were a high fashion lady in the 19th century, then you would have definitely come into contact with these fine sellers and makers of women's hats. They were usually located in bigger cities where the higher end families would either live or spend their time. And you should take a look at some of these hats. They are works of art. Maybe some are a little whack, but hey. Number three, con men. You'll like this one, guys. You're gonna like this one. There's nothing more peculiar, more strange, more theatrical than a snake oil salesman. Where would John Marston be without Nigel West Dickens? I don't know. They were traveling salesmen who were swindlers, liars, crooks, thieves, selling pseudoscience products to folks who just didn't know any better. It would work something like this. I would show up in town with my traveling cart of wares and mysteries. There, standing on a small crate, like the one I'm standing on right now, I would give the town my best sales pitch. <clears throat> Introducing Dr. Andrew's new and improved Life Bigger Supplements. Here before you find folks is a tall bottle of rejuvenation made from the finest ingredients across the globe. Ginger, ginseng, milkweed, red sage, English mace, golden currant, and as if that weren't enough, Dr. Andrew's new and improved Vigor Supplement has the minerals and vitamins that carry you through a long day's work in the fields. Vitamin A through K, copper, iron, potassium. This bottle here is not to only put a pep in your step and refill your stamina, but also cures what ails you. A proven cure for fever, chills, indigestion, cholera, yellow fever, dysentery, and even known to help heal broken bones. Modern science has brought this gift to you today, ladies and gentlemen. And all you have to do now is say yes. Say yes to rejuvenation and yes to Dr. Andrew's new improved bigger supplement. I think you guys get the point. $49.99. Number two, a photographer. Want to never smile for eternity? Get your picture taken in the Old West. During the 1860s and 70s, the frontier was a wondrous, exotic place, which made it an excellent place to be a photographer. Sure, you had people who could draw and paint the landscapes and the people of the place, but people were distrusting of artists' interpretations. Pictures sold you the place exactly as it was. The high quality images were in high demand. Every government survey and all the major railroads had official photographers. Photographs made for excellent evidence of plots of land, mines, and other structures for investors. But that's boring. More excitingly, common people with a bit of money would often go and get really not grim, not boring pictures taken like this. Number one, gunslinger. I bet you when someone says wild, wild west, the first thing you think of is a gunslinger. A cowboy riding his horse into the sunset with his cowboy hat and big iron on his hip. Every step into the saloon is echoed with the jingle jangle of spurs on the heels of his leather boots. No, this isn't a country singer concert. This is the old west, the life of a lonesome gunslinger and outlaw, riding town to town, either getting away from trouble or looking for it, really. The same kind of folks who got their name up on a wanted poster. Just be sure Sheriff String being in around to look for you. That's all I could say. Also, fun fact, bounty hunting is still allowed in the US today. That's crazy. Who would have thought? Number 10, bank robberies. Okay, when we hear about the wild, wild, rootin' tootin', wild west, whatever, we think of outlaws like Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch, the James Younger Gang. Apparently, it was just bank robbery central back then. Just a lot of a lot of this and tapping and riding horses and stuff. That's really not true. Bank robberies didn't happen that often in real life. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies. Eight. That many years ago, along 15 western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. Much more than eight. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by the famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Fun rootin' tootin' history. Number nine, camels. My favorite actor growing up, hands down, was Woody from Toy Story. The guy's physical comedy was on point. And no, I don't mean Tom Hanks. I mean Woody, with this crazy little cowboy run, tipping his hat. But what's a cowboy without his horse, right? As soon as Bullseye got introduced in Toy Story 2, the picture was complete. A cowboy and a horse. We've seen this combo at some point in our lives everywhere. But did you know that for around 100 years, camels were part of Texas wildlife? So imagine a cowboy on a camel. 
Yeah, that's real, That's that happened. Imagine two cowboys on the humps of a camel. How silly and intimidating would that look? Back in 1855, Congress spent thousands to purchase and ship feral camels from Egypt. The hot southwest would make sense when it comes to camels doing their camel thing. But by 1857, the army had 70 camels, things were going well until, you know, the Civil War happened, and then the camels escaped and all that madness, and then from then on, for 100 years or so, they bred and roamed Texas. Yeehaw, on a camel, how fun. Number eight, cowboys. All right, since we're talking about cowboys, let's really talk about cowboys. Who were these guys? Was everybody just a cowboy off the bat or did you have to earn it like a knight? What's the deal here? Well, the guys that we picture in our brain, like Woody, those are cattle herders and then buffalo, thousands of them, they would roam the land to eat and find water. They would travel miles away, so the herders would follow on horseback and then drive them back to the ranch. They mostly ate beans, dried meat, obviously, and a lot of coffee. Those are the three main ingredients of yeeing and hawing. Am I a cowboy? I love beans and coffee. Coffee beans? Huh, don't even get me started. A classic Western outfit was the denim jeans and chaps, the leather covers that you know go over your legs. The large rim hats were called Stetsons. Aside from looking cool, they were large enough to keep the sun out of your eyes. That hat would also double down as a drinking bowl for their horse. Sharing is caring. Number seven, the Bison Express. Humans are responsible for the disappearance on many, many wild animals in one way or another. It's usually our fault. Yeah, going back to the wild, wild west, the year 1869 specifically, that's when the Pacific Railroad was done. It was open to the west to all these explorers, but now they were whipping across these wild lands in record speed, passing hundreds of bison every single trip. Eventually, it didn't take long for these railroads to advertise hunting excursions on these trains. So yeah, guests would climb aboard the top of the train cars and hunt on the top of the trains. Yeah, on the top, they would just shoot these animals for sport. Obviously, the train couldn't stop and go back for the bodies, so they would just leave them. This one man, Orlando Bond, nicknamed The Brick, okay, he apparently shot thousands himself. He rode the express so many times his rifle caused him to go deaf in one ear. This was done purposely to deprive Native Americans of their food supply. Now our bison's number are incredibly low, something like 2% of what it once was, and humans, well, we're still pretty garbage. What do you know? Number six, alcohol. These saloons cowboys would visit, was there a bouncer? Did you need two pieces of ID? What was the drinking age back then? Well, besides the swinging saloon doors, it really wasn't a fun time at all. Alcohol back then, first of all, was basically just poison. Actually, it was literally poison sometimes. They had whiskey like 40 rods and Tao's lightning. You have a couple of those and you're literally passing out in minutes. Nobody was getting cut off in old timey saloons. The bartender wasn't like, hey, how about a water, buddy? Let's get you home. No, it was show. They had this one drink on bar rail called Tarantula Juice. Yeah, happy 21st birthday. Go throw up. It was made from strychnine, which was actual poison. So when the whiskey wore off, the strychnine would be left over in the patron's body, and it felt like tarantulas were crawling all over your skin. Ugh, yeah, I'm good with a Bud Light Lime. Thanks, man. Number five, banking. Today, online banking is super easy, but back in the old West days, you didn't get a courtesy email. You didn't have overdraft, nothing like that. In fact, the United States national banking system didn't even exist until 1863. So what happened before then? Are we just hiding our money in our underwear, what are we doing? Before then, you'd have what were called wildcat banks. And these wildcat banks would take deposits for a short amount of time, and then unannounced, out of nowhere, they would run, they would disappear overnight with all of your money, everything, your whole life savings, gone. They did the long con, they played the long game, they were actors. So you're telling me they pretended to be bankers for months at a time? That's almost impressive, they'd have the fake mustache, oh, good morning, sir, I'm sign here, please. <laughs> They lied, they faked it for months. They just lied for months and then dipped out of nowhere. Thankfully, after 1863, a noble profession was to work at a bank and, you know, not steal everybody's money. The Hudson Bay Company, Wells Fargo, these big names, they all gained trust over time because of these fake Looney Tune banks. You imagine, how do you not break character? You're like, okay, and that's you all set up. <laughs> They're like, we got it, we got it, go. Number four, seam squirrels. Nothing to do with squirrels before you get upset. Here we go. During the Old West era, personal hygiene was not a priority for many people. And lice infestations were all too common. Nice, now I'm itchy doing this list, love that. The type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as 
body lice, which could be, well, obviously found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. I got some squirrels on my body, nice, that's great. So itchy, so disgusting. Body lice was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, relapsing fever, all the fevers, any fever just coming your way, right into your mouth and eyes, horrible. These diseases were often fatal and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. So to combat the spread of lice and the diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely bald. Bunch of bald cowboys. Bunch of naked bald cowboys walking around being like, where's my money? I thought this was a bank. Number three, resurrectionalist. While Boot Hill sees folks going into the ground, a resurrectionalist was responsible for the exact opposite. Yeah, bring them back up. We actually made a mistake. Get that guy back out of there. These guys were responsible for digging up dead bodies, and then they would sell them to medical schools for like $9. It was really disgusting. Now, this was the late 1820s, and at this time in Edinburgh, Scotland, believe it or not, the medical science community was on the up and up, so this was needed for that to work. But in order to study new medicines and, you know, avoid the next plague, they needed these guys. They needed these resurrectionalists to rise the dead, like they're a White Walker in Game of Thrones. I don't know, that's what I imagine in my head. Would you rather work a Boot Hill type job or would you rather get paid to dig up bodies? Put them in or take them out? Comment down below. Both are so horrible. Couldn't imagine picking. Number two, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, the old Western saloons, kicking in those crazy doors, we imagine some catchphrases and whiskey and all that fun stuff. Everyone's loud, it's Peaky Blinders, whatever. No, not at all. It was the exact opposite of fun. The bartender would pour a drink, the cowboy would take the bottle instead because he's uh, an alcoholic and also that's super illegal. Back in the Wild West days, you could do whatever you want. You could drink what you want, you could serve what you want anything goes. Bartenders also had no regulations to follow behind that sketchy bar. So not only was it very high proof, but some bevies like tarantula juice would just straight up kill you. Yeah, if its name didn't tip you off, if you're drinking tarantula juice, it's cause it's made with poisonous ingredients. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine and if you drink it, well, you'll feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. Huh, how fun is that? Cool. Which button do I press to not tip? Thanks so much. Number one, medical shows. Today, medical shows are fascinating. Even on YouTube, Dr. Pimple Popper, are you kidding me? I, I can gag all day and watch that, it's the best. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s to the 1890s specifically, they had what's called medicinal showmen. Now these guys, these showstoppers, they would show up in your town selling elixirs and tonics because everyone needed one, of course. Everyone needs to live a happy and comfortable life, but they were full of lies. Don't listen to these guys, all right? These professional medicinal showmen would have have pawns run ahead, stay in your town, and then wait. They would plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixir shows began. So they'd call up random audience members, one of these being their buddy, and then these magical elixirs would treat their ailments just like that. What an amazing show. I'm in. I'm going to buy this immediately. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, and it was said to treat any illness back in the day. But in reality, it was an extremely strong laxative. So imagine finding that out on the way home. You're like, hey, I'm, uh, I'm exploding out of my body. What's going on? I don't think that worked back there. 